with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, August 18th, 2021. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, proprietor of the Forever Wars Substack, Spencer Ackerman, on his new book, Reign of Terror, how the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump. Also on the program today, Taliban claim there will be no reprisals. Mm Mm-hmm. U.S. military takes over half of the Kabul airport. Meanwhile, congressional Democrats fall over themselves to investigate the Afghan withdrawal. U.K. announces it will take 20,000 Afghan refugees over the course of five years. Meanwhile, Alabama has negative ICU beds free negative ICU beds free in Alabama. And the Republican Texas Governor Abbott, three times vaccinated, getting monoclonal treatment for breakthrough COVID, still supporting his ban of mask mandates in Texas schools to protect unvaccinated children. Haiti earthquake toll tops 2,000 people now. TSA in this country extends the airline mask requirement until January of 2022. And Nancy Pelosi plans a test vote on Monday to challenge the corporate Democrats obstructing the infrastructure bill. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. It is Wednesday. Hump day. Hump day, as uh, Emma Vigeland says. Hello, Emma. I think some other people say it. I don't want to own hump day. Did you, you did you not coin that term? Uh, is this news to you? Uh, it's the first I've heard of it. Oh, well, uh, then I did, actually. Wow. It's, it, is, it's, it sounds... Uh, I get it. It's like uh, you're right at the uh, precipice of the week. Right, and, because uh, the week is seven days. Precipice? No, maybe. And then know. the middle day... Gotcha. Bingo. Well, actually, we actually, that's not true because it's about the weekday. The weekday is five days. That's correct. So I knew. the middle day is Wednesday. Wednesday. There you go. Solved. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thanks for, for joining us. Very excited to have Spencer Ackerman on uh, the program today. Um, this piece, uh, in, in and of itself... Uh, of uh, video is uh, indicative of a dynamic in this country, but it's particularly relevant, I think, to um, Spencer Ackerman's uh, thesis today, um, which is that, and we'll get into this more about uh, when we talk about the book, but in many respects, the era uh, following 9-11 in terms of both uh, mechanically, but also in terms of our politics, um, sort of greased the uh, rails to revive a big part of uh, of what propelled Donald Trump to his presidency, racism, anti-immigrant fervor. And um, here's Charlie Kirk. This guy is sort of, uh, you know, having to transition from being a you know very old college student (laughs) who was um 
uh, chairing TPUSA, and he's seeing the, the, the writing on the wall. Uh, maybe some of his funding is um, is having problems because his um, mi- uh, you know billionaire or millionaire benefactor uh, passed away a year or two ago, and so he's doing a show now. And uh, Rush Limbaugh cleared the field a little bit mm-hmm. um, in departing the um, the scene, as it were. And uh, here's Charlie Kirk having a. Uh, I mean, imagine. I don't know if Charlie Kirk believes that Joe Biden intentionally um, forced this scene that's taking place at the uh, at, at Kabul. I don't know if he's ignoring the 20 years of history of Afghanistan. I don't know if he thinks it's in the the, the level of d- dementia, dementedness, I should say, uh, uh, exhibited by Charlie Kirk here is pretty impressive. Um, and it is all in service of a racist, um, anti-immigrant, and you know probably a little misogyny thrown in there as well. Sure. Uh, here is uh, Charlie Kirk responding to the fall of Afghanistan with, of course, the normal reaction. Biden's Department of Defense will accept thirty thousand Afghan refugees into military installations following the collapse of Kabul. Political transformation. Let the country crumble. Do you know there's 5 million displaced people in Afghanistan now? This was all intentional. Joe Biden let it fall apart to now say, oh, I'm so sorry. I guarantee you Joe Biden's speech this afternoon will talk about refugee assistance and relocation support. Now Joe Biden's going to be scrambling to make good on it, and the liberal media will love it. They'll say, oh, yes, okay, now I get it. Joe Biden is now fixing his own problem. Joe Biden is stepping up and he's allowing a flow of people from the Middle East into America. Thank you, Joe Biden. You're such a hero. So benevolent. You're so respectful. You're so compassionate. Do you see what's going on here? What's going on here is Joe Biden wants a couple hundred thousand more Elon Omars to come into America to change the body politic permanently. Huh. We're playing checkers and they're playing chess. Oh, were it so? Uh, I mean, <laughs> well, let's just do a little bit of math. First off, let's just take it. Uh, let's just take it at face value for a moment. Okay. Thirty thousand refugees, and I would argue this is way too low. But again, we're just going to take this to face value. Is not going to transform the country. Well, it's just the beginning. I mean, if you were maybe, maybe, to bring. 30,000 refugees to one small town, you would see a political transformation in that town. Yeah, but he's not talking about Afghanistan, right? He's talking about Somalia. Well, he's talking, no, well, now you're getting, now you're getting ahead of it. Now, um, he is arguing that Joe Biden specifically um, uh, allowed the Taliban to take over the country to create a refugee crisis because he, Joe Biden thinks it's in his political, um, uh, it is helpful for him politically to bring in um, 30,000 or even 100,000 uh, or even hundreds of thousands of, of Afghan refugees. Now, there is no doubt that we could absorb uh, a couple hundred thousand Afghan refugees without, with, with a blink of an eye. With a blink of an eye, we could do that. Politically, Frankly, I'm not quite convinced that this would help, uh, a, you know, any party one, more over one over the other. Um, the, certainly Afghans have grievances with, well, I would imagine, with both parties. And uh, culturally, I imagine um, Afghans are far more, um, you know, uh, sympathetic to the uh, conservative cultural values, maybe, of some of the Republicans. Um particularly the more religious. I mean, Mike Pence, uh, the vice president, he won't even he won't even have dinner with women, uh, you know, that he's who he works with because mm-hmm. he's married. Um, Too tempting. Similar uh, dynamic. Um, but it's also just insane. And it's also incredibly uh, heartless. And the idea that we could have hundreds of thousands of of refugees who come into this country and um become Congress people, that would be fantastic. First off, we would need to expand Congress, which I'm also in favor of. 
I don't know if I would do it into the hundreds of thousands, but that would be great. Well, he's indicating that they'll be able to vote, which we don't know. But of course, then they'll have kids and they'll be brown and they'll be in your communities. And you don't really want that, right? You mentioned it's racist. You mentioned it's anti-immigrant. I mean, the biggest through line is like part of the racism is the Islamophobia. They want to continue. It's the Islamophobia. And though it's also the same sort of white nationalism that we hear Tucker Carlson talk about, right? Immigrants equals political transformation. Yes. This is no, and this, and this goes back to Pat Buchanan. It goes back to the John Birchers. It goes back to uh, uh, anti-Chinese immigration laws. I mean, this is a, this is a tried, true history, uh, you know, a uh, sort of uh, principle of the United States. But they connected to a terrorist attack in this country, which increases the ferocity of it. And we were surveilling, at least in terms of how we treated a group in this country in modern America. There's nothing like what we've seen of how we've treated Muslim people in and, this country. And that, surveilled them. And that is uh, a great segue into uh, Spencer Ackerman's book. which we will uh, get to uh, just after this break. We'll be right back after this. Got a couple of sponsors on the program today. Emma's favorite. Oh, Jesus. (laughs) It's my fault for saying hump day. Yep. Rump day. Hey, uh, exactly. It's rump day, folks. Summer's here. Living ain't easy if you got swamp ass. Everybody knows that. Don't have to. Uh, Many people are saying the living ain't easy. How are you going to stay on top of your uh, sweaty bottom? Well, I'll tell you, it's a refreshing spray from a Hello Tushy Bidet. Yes, you can uh, keep yourself uh, fresh and clean all summer long with the brand new Hello Tushy 3.0 modern bidet attachment. But don't kid yourself, we're going into fall. Works just as well. It is stylish. It is eco-friendly. It is super easy to install and dramatically less expensive than you think it is. And in addition, it ongoingly, on an ongoing basis, saves you money. Hello Tushy 3.0 doesn't just clean your butt with a precise stream of fresh water. It cleans itself with the Smart Spray automatic nozzle. It attaches to your existing toilet. You don't need any electricity at all. You don't need any extra plumbing. Cuts your toilet paper use by 80%. Pays for itself in a few months. I can't believe how much toilet paper is. Yeah. I mean, like, like, uh, like uh, you could be like, I don't know, like, it's ridiculous it's like, ridiculous it, the charm I, I thought about this the other day it's like oh i want to get a six pack of Charmin, and it's that much money it, i can't remember if it's like tw- it like 20 bucks or something like that it's something crazy. like that yeah. you get like a you know the four time roll because you can't get the smaller ones anymore anyways the point is um hello tushy is the way to go if you've ever been bidet curious like i was uh this is a great way uh to fundamentally change something that we all do uh, 60, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Okay. 60 day risk-free guarantee, 12 month warranty. If you've already got a Hello Tushy, treat yourself to the new 3.0 model. You will join millions of happy Hello Tushy customers. Uh, defeat Swamp Ass, go to hellotushy.com slash majority, get 10% off plus free shipping. This is a special offer for our listeners at hellotushy.com slash majority for 10% off. Hellotushy.com slash majority. Also, uh, here is a a common scenario. You need to see a doctor. You search, you find one that looks good. You wait on hold to book an appointment. You rearrange your schedule. Then you finally go in and find out this doctor doesn't even take your insurance. But there's a solution. You download the free ZocDoc app. It's the easiest way to find a great doctor and instantly book an appointment. And you can search local doctors to find out who takes your insurance. You read uh, verified patient reviews and you can book an appointment and you can do so uh, in person or video chat. Uh, You don't have to wait on hold with a receptionist. Whether you need a primary care physician, dentist, dermatologist, psychiatrist, eye doctor, or other specialist, ZocDoc has you covered. You guys have used this quite a bit, right? I Yeah, I, it's just so much easier um, to be able to look at the calendar and book your appointment, and you don't need to waste time on the phone, and sometimes you can't reach or you don't have the right number. Doctors have multiple offices. This makes it a lot more simple. Look, you go to ZocDoc.com slash majority. You download the ZocDoc app to sign up, and it's free. 
Every month, millions of people use ZocDoc, including half of this office. ZocDoc makes healthcare easy, and now is the time to prioritize your health. Go to ZocDoc.com slash majority. Download the ZocDoc app to sign up for free and book a top-rated doctor. Many are, as, uh, many are available as soon as today. That's ZocDoc, Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash majority. ZocDoc dot com slash majority. All right. Um, very excited to welcome back to the program Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, the proprietor of the Forever War Wars newsletter on Substack, and author of his first book, Reign of Terror, How the 9-11 Era Destabilized America and Produced a Trump. Uh, Spencer Ackerman, welcome uh, back to the show. I'm here with Emma Viglin. Hi, Sam. Hi, Emma. Uh, so, you know, uh, Spencer, we, we played a clip of Charlie Kirk uh, at the top of the show talking about how uh, Joe Biden had, uh, had purposely um, wanted uh, this, uh, the, the Taliban to uh, overrun Kabul uh, to create this um, sympathy for these uh, internal and external or would be external refugees so that he could uh, bring in thousands of immigrants and fundamentally have a a political change in this country change the nature of of our country and it occurred to me that this is um very much the the thesis of your book this combination of of the uh war on terror that is that has been uh, perp uh, perpetrated for uh, 20 years and it's sort of like melding into this message uh of of anti-immigrant and and racism that Charlie Kirk and Donald Trump, uh, and uh, you know, have sort of uh, risen upon. That's right. This has been there from the start of the war on terror. These are the politics of the war on terror. Uh, the way I uh, wrote about this uh, this week for my Substack Forever Wars uh, is that uh, this was uh, the return of white replacement theory version 1.0. Um, what do I mean by that? I mean by what we saw uh, by degree. Uh, used against American Muslims uh, after 9-11 and then very aggressively uh, yielding way to Trump is a constrained space for American Muslims to enjoy the benefits of citizenship. This was what was behind uh, something that I think a lot of, of observers, um, certainly liberal observers, but some on the left as well, kind of dismissed. Um, when uh, state houses around the country under Republican governance uh, passed laws to ban Sharia law, that we didn't quite understand what was really at play here. Um, if you were not Muslim, you had the luxury of being able not to understand uh, what was happening here. This is the same impulse that transformed a uh, cultural center comparable to the 92nd Street Y on the Upper East Side of New York from uh, a symbol of cosmopolitanism and a contribution to the intellectual life of New York City into the Ground Zero Mosque in 2010. When that happened, there were predictable consequences. Uh, a person who was working as a cab driver uh, in New York City during the Ground Zero Mosque outrages uh, was stabbed uh, when a mosque uh, outside Murfreesboro, Tennessee, um, expanded in order to cover uh, its you know, ever increasing um, uh, congregations of, of worshipers. Worshipers who I might add, many of whom were refugees from the Iraq war. Uh, that was scandalized, that was blocked, um, and that was deeply uh, demonized by the local power structure uh, over there to the point where signs for the mosque would be shot at. This is where this all comes from. This is a narrative of replacement. That was what was at work with saying, as they put it themselves, Newt Gingrich talked about this in a speech at the American Enterprise Institute, which is to say that before this was not considered respectable, this was respectable. Uh, this was done by respectable people, people with power and influence. Newt Gingrich was, of course, the Speaker of the House. He talked about the point of the advancing Sharia law in the United States was to replace the Constitution, replace the American way of life. This was how it got to the point where 
the white supremacists with the tiki torches could march through Charlottesville uh, saying that they would not be replaced by Jews. This is what's happening here. This is their response to the human disaster that is not just the withdrawal from Afghanistan, but the Afghanistan war itself, that the actual enemies turn out to be not what the sort of mainstream understandings, uh, the explicit text, for lack of a better term, uh, of the war on terror say they are, not the Taliban. The Taliban aren't the real enemy here at all. The enemies are the people escaping the Taliban, the people who are trying to live in what the United States is uh, disastrous wars promise but never deliver, freedom and safety. And this is exactly what we saw after the rise of the so-called Islamic State, where governments across Europe and in, you know several states in the United States, I think ultimately 30 of them, um, insist the response is to build a respectable, uh, in some cases in Europe in particular, liberal version of Donald Trump's border wall. And we have to recognize this as the fruits of the war on terror and the war on terror giving every motive, opportunity, and validation to these sorts of uh, re-empowered nativist currents. We, you know, and, and for, for folks who are too young to, to remember this, the uh, the 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 passage of those state houses, you know, uh, um, passing anti-Sharia law resolutions or, or is, is very similar to the sort of the critical race theory can't be taught in kindergartens, um, uh, you know, movement of today. And so let's uh, let's go back to uh, uh, pre 9-11. In fact, let's go. Uh, you start the, uh, the the book in um, in Oklahoma um, and. You know, one of the things that occurred to me was in, 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 you know, bringing me back to that time was there was this period of time where when the when the wall fell and the Soviet Union uh, essentially uh, dissipated, that there was like a the, there the right in this country was sort of and and maybe the whole country on some level was sort of searching around for you know the enemy and it was sort of a very confusing time you know uh and and um and sort of in that uh, uh that that vacuum we get oklahoma bombing and timothy mcveigh why why did you start there i started there for two reasons one of which is cheeky and the other which i hope is seen as serious um, the cheeky reason is that uh, I start the book uh, with a journalistic cliche. Uh, I take you to a terror training camp uh, where we meet all kinds of uh, basically crazy people, uh, crazy violent people, crazy violent misogynists um, who are like dedicated uh, to both like kind of training themselves and uh, seeking out um, an exceptionally backward and violent uh, new status quo, except I wanted these to be white people. I didn't want to do uh, the thing that you've read um, throughout a whole lot of, you know, very poor um, war on terror journalism, some of which it embarrasses me to say I have written, um, where, you know, only those non-white people and those and those Muslim people um, at such camps are, are treated this way. And then the more profound thing is that, or I hope it's profound, um, is that uh, in order to see the whole war on terror, in order to see something we typically discuss in terms of its component parts, Afghanistan, Iraq, Guantanamo, torture, um, surveillance, you know, down the line, um, we need to see who the exceptions to the war on terror are. We need to see that after the impact of what was at the time the most devastating terrorist attack in American history, the response by the political system uh, by the Democratic and the Republican parties is not to construct uh, the apparatus of repression and uh, globally licensed violence uh, that happens after 9-11. It's instead um, to first blame Muslims for committing this activity. Uh, secondly, uh, to derive uh, as a response the narrowest possible definition of a response, a response only geared around McVeigh and his immediate associates. Um, and it listens during this period to what I think are valuable and valid, enduringly valid and universally valid 
objections that say to do otherwise, to uh, say that people with superficial associations uh, to people who commit acts of violence ought not to come under an atmosphere of suspicion that they can probably never escape and that redressing uh, problems you have politically with such people who, again, who don't commit the act of violence with the machinery of state repression, the extremely punitive, coercive, um, and intimidating uh, powers of law enforcement and of prosecutors, um, that wouldn't be right. That wouldn't be a real substitute to confronting uh, those uh, propositions politically. America sympathizes with that when terrorism is white. When terrorism is not white, it is a much different story. All right, so, so the the idea is that um, following and and there's 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 two sort of like uh, the main thrusts to the so-called war on terror. One is the uh, you know or the post nine eleven era. Let's say it is the mechanical um, sort of material response to that um, that that involves the the literal surveillance and then uh, you know the the wars and the drones and and. And, um, and and more, and then there's the the political, um, and and so let's try and sort of you know uh, uh, we have younger viewers who don't remember that era, following 9/11, where you know James Comey, um, well, you know was a was a key player in this uh, Robert Ashcroft era, where they would spy on uh, on Muslims because they were Muslim. <laughs> um, to a degree that I don't think people sort of really remember at this point. Uh, talk about the databases, talk about the infiltration of the student youth groups. I, I just remember being in New York and hearing like there was five Muslims who were driving down from you know upstate New York and got pulled over, that type of stuff. Uh, Fort Dix five, I mean, there was many, many stories like this. Um, so I'm from uh, Brooklyn, New York. I'm a native of uh, a neighborhood called Flatbush. And right nearby me, is a very small uh, enclave uh, known as Little Pakistan, uh, a working class uh, immigrant neighborhood. And I recently went back and looked at uh, some of the reports that people from that neighborhood filed uh, after 9-11. And these are reports from young teenagers, uh, girls and boys who were 13, 14, 15, 16 years old, talking about how not just from fellow students, uh, but from teachers and from police. They were called Osama. They were treated as terrorists. They were told to go back to their country. These are my neighbors. This is New York. And that was the tenor of the response that a generation of Muslim children and not even just Muslims, uh, it's, it's often forgotten, but once an apparatus of suspicion arose that treated immigration not as a tool to make more Americans, but as the vector of a national security threat. All immigrants who are stuck dealing with the immigration authorities in the United States get treated like that. Uh, there's an excellent book uh, by uh, Trump Nguyen uh, called We Are All Suspects Now that traces this in non-Muslim uh, immigrant communities. Um, this was the tenor of the war on terror. Uh, there was, you mentioned databases. The Department of Homeland Security uh, created a database called NSEERS, uh, which was in all you know, functions by any other name, a Muslim registry. It was a registry of people from Muslim backgrounds, Muslim majority countries, uh, and countries with heavy Muslim populations that had to register in this database. Um, and many, many, many of them uh, were deported as the result of this. This was a circumstance in which John Ashcroft, at the time George W. Bush's attorney general, guided by an immigration advisor we would come to know very well uh, more recently in the Trump era named Chris Kobach, uh, who invited Muslims in this country to prove their loyalty by, particularly if they were non-citizens looking for a path to citizenship, by informing on their communities. Ashcroft, when called on this, responded to it with absolute umbrage. Uh, this was so bad and repressive and, uh, you know, that even like chiefs of certain police departments, like 
were not comfortable uh, performing it, which should really tell you quite a lot. Um, Ashcroft goes to testify uh, before uh, the Senate in December of 2001 and says in words I'll just never forget that the people who were complaining about this, the people who were saying this was wrong, were the people who the United States had to worry about. They were people who were, defi who were, who were dividing America by criticizing the lawless actions and the repressive racist actions of their government. And he goes, those who continue uh, to scare Americans with, and these were his words, phantoms of lost liberty, were those people whose actions, he says, only aid terrorism. That was the political culture of the 9-11 era. That culture may have receded somewhat. I would argue, in fact, that all it has done is been normalized. And we live today currently in that uh, in those politics, our, our, our politics, our uh, economic system, uh, our society is very profoundly and very materially shaped by this. It occurs within our, our politics, uh, within guidelines, particularly when it comes uh, to discussions of security set by the war on terror. And, 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 and we should say, like, you know, at this point, it becomes, uh, I think, uh, clear for folks how uh, the war on terror is a uh, a way of saying um we're going to normalize and legitimize um a, a racism or anti-muslim uh perspective which then begins to sort of revive both the anti-immigrant uh sentiment and uh, as we move through the Bush years we normalize uh torture to a large extent um or at least you know uh, no, you're you know, right. You're right. Debatable. Go uh, off, King. Right. And <laughs> well, I mean, it, you know, we all remember this. And um, and and I, I just it, it just occurred to me today, like, you know, when we're, we're hearing the Democrats crawl over each other to talk about the failure of the withdrawal. Like, I'm like, well, how about you go back to the Senate torture report? Let's see if we can get that out, too, now that we control the Senate. Um, but uh, with that said, we, we, we go through the Bush years and it, this mutates or really doesn't have to mutate very far into, you know, via uh, Barack Obama into sort of like it, it sort of becomes the bridge or, or Barack Obama and this sort of anti-Muslim uh, fervor and anti-immigrant uh, uh, fervor becomes the, the bridge into where we are now, both both from a material and from a political perspective. Um, why don't, let's talk a little bit about the material. I mean, there's uh, been, you know, and, and certainly back in the day, I think like, uh, you know, Charlie Savage covered a lot of the, the this dynamic where Barack Obama comes in, gets this lawless regime of the, uh, of the Bush administration, both from a, sort of a drone perspective from a uh, a torture perspective and he basically so codifies it and and makes it legal as opposed to getting rid of it talk about that dynamic are are you guys lord of the rings people uh well i think i am more than sam it's been a while for me i'm gonna get back into it with my kids soon but so yeah. so uh when uh the alliance of elves and men succeeds in uh, miraculously defeating Sauron, uh, their final task is to throw the One Ring into the fires of Mount Doom. And when this happens, Isildur uh, takes the ring and goes out onto kind of like this rocky platform and, and the fires below await. And this is the moment of true victory. And Elrond, King of the Elves, is screaming at him, throw it into the fire! throw it into the fire and then Isildur looks at the ring and thinks this ring is nothing but a tool what if it had wise leadership mm -hmm. what amazing things would I be able to accomplish through it and he decides instead of destroying the ring he is wise enough and strong enough to wield the ring and so the ring survives and ultimately corrupts those who wield it 
and will return Sauron to life and to power. And that's the story I tell in the book of Barack Obama and the war on terror. The way I start um, the chapter on uh, Obama um, is through a perspective I think um, we in the United States do not often hear, um, we in journalism do not often pursue. Um, and that's with a young man named Fahim Qureshi. Fahim Qureshi uh, was 13 years old, living in tribal Pakistan in a village called Zaraki, um, where he was uh, one Friday um, attending um, uh, a big reception for a cousin who had returned from a business trip to the United Arab Emirates. And all of a sudden he remembered hearing a sound like a plane taking off. And what had happened was Fahim Qureshi, after emerging from a coma 40 days later, uh, with burns over much of his body, was a survivor of Barack Obama's first drone strike. He would be the first of probably thousands of people um, who had been uh, caught in uh, the fires of, of the drone strikes. Uh, a series of strikes that Obama saw not as a continuity of the war on terror, but an alternative to it, a more humane way of conducting necessary counterterrorism operations, uh, not the excesses of the Bush administration with its uh, agonizing invasions and occupations of other people's countries. But this was uh, the humane and restrained, and ultimately I call it in the book, sustainable way to conduct um, the war on terror. And I asked when I had interviewed Fahim, um, I, I, I heard his story of what his life was like after um, you know, the, the 2009 strike. And he talked about how, you know, his, his, um, his primary breadwinners in his family, uh, many of the adult men in his family uh, were killed in this strike. And so now he had to be one of his family's um, primary supporters. And he had to just, you know, give up on his dreams. He had wanted to be a chemist um, and take whatever jobs he could make his um, forever wounded body perform. Um, and he did this uh, while uh, being rebuffed by both Pakistani and American authorities for even the recognition of what was done to him. Uh, to this day, he has received only like a kind of like lump sum payment. He received blood money, but also hush money as a way of saying, we're not going to acknowledge what we did to you, but you know, here's some money to deal with it. Um, and I asked him, what do you think of Barack Obama? And Fahim said, Barack Obama, if there is a list of tyrants anywhere in the world, Barack Obama's name is on that list. And I don't really think you can argue with that man's experience. Yeah, and 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 we should say, I mean, it, the the part of that sustainability, and, and and I should also just say, you know, in service of the book, that you you, you speak to um, uh, people who were um, men who were tortured as as teenagers at uh, Guantanamo. Uh, and uh, folks who were ra wrapped up in uh, the, the Patriot Act, uh, you know, for, for donating uh, uh, money to a charity. I mean, on, on and on throughout the, your your book, you're you're addressing sort of both ends of of, of this war on terror. Um, that element of Obama, both that he changed the mechanism and brought it under a legal regime, I think, is also what made that sort of. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that. You know, if you take and I, I don't it, it's always sort of like, you know, uh, you got to be tentative when you go down this road. But but, you know, you step back. The most horrific things that have happened in world history have been legal. <laughs> they have been put under a regime of legality and that gives them the durability and the sustainability to last. And that is one of the things I think that that Obama did that is uh, was the most sort of. Um, not necessarily horrific, but the most problematic in terms of maintaining the, the, the sustainability of this is creating these legal regimes uh, that allow it to be within, supposedly within the law, uh, but also still uh, just incredibly horrific. Um, and so that is the, the, the mechanical thing that happens uh, and 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 we see the the capitulation and and the 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 left or the broadly the you know the the the, the Democrats um, sort of be okay with this uh, and 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 voters also accepting into this notion that you know uh, Barack Obama I mean I just remember um, I I can't remember which um, 
uh, uh, spokesperson it was for Obama. But when he was uh, questioned about the killing, not only of Alwa, uh, Anwar Alwaki, who was the uh, supposed uh, uh, preacher who was, uh, you know, American, who was uh, uh, preaching uh, a jihad against America, but his 16-year-old son. And then also subsequent to that, uh, ultimately, uh, the, the daughter as well. But the 16-year-old son was killed. And the response by a uh, an Obama uh, official was, well, his dad was a bad guy. Yeah. And they were not killed simultaneously. I mean, to be clear, this was not a, a collateral damage situation. They took out this guy, too. Um, and there was no, it, it, it basically, I don't know. Passed. It was normalized. Here's was what, normalized. Here, here's the thing. This is why it's important to, on the one hand, recognize that like, you know, atrocities of regimes, uh, state terror, um, occurs within, uh, the patina of legality. It's, it's what a society, um, or at least the overclass of that society normalizes, right? That's the difference. Uh, these acts didn't need to be legal. These acts just needed to be lawyered. This is what Giorgio Agamben, the Italian philosopher, refers to as the state of exception, that these are extraordinary acts that license state violence and give it a patina of legitimacy so that it doesn't tell itself that those regimes, those legal regimes have in fact been transformed, have been like functionally abrogated and ripped up. That's what we live in today. That is what Donald Trump does with these things. That is how we get to a point where there was drone surveillance over 15 cities last summer that joint terrorism task forces take uh, actions against supposed anti-fascist protesters and that Black Lives Matter is being told to be dealt with uh, as if they were terrorists uh, from the ultimate symbol an institution of the war on terror, the Department of Homeland Security. And under Barack Obama, what happens is that Obama decides that these operations, uh, in order for them to continue within what he considers appropriate boundaries, have to be wrapped within a belt of bureaucratic process, where intelligence officials, military officials, and the lawyers, both within the White House, the Justice Department, and all these different agencies, meter out and throttle who can be executed. And stripped of euphemism, that's what it is. Um, you mentioned Charlie's excellent book, Power Wars. I commend everyone. Um, you should really read Power Wars. Um, what Power Wars traces is how a divide existed very early in the Obama administration between the attorneys who take power within the Obama administration, who had been vociferously against George W. Bush and his version of the war on terror, but were now, in fact, split from the human rights uh, critics of the Bush administration and the people that wanted not uh, restraint in the war on terror, but the abolition of the war on terror, because as I believe it's uh, an Obama administration attorney, Mary DeRosa, who Charlie quotes in the book saying like, the thing is, is that what we're really about is the rule of law. We are not really about uh, the problems um, that you have to the operations of counterterrorism that's going on. but. It was never the rule of law. It was the rule of lawyers. Right. Well, we saw how fungible that could be under the Bush administration and then under the Obama administration. I just wonder, Spencer, if you have fears that the Biden administration, despite like holding shockingly firm on this Afghanistan with withdrawal, there's not really structural changes being made in the way of limiting the people who might want to fall back on legal principles in pushing forward the war on terror? Um, I, you know, I'll, these are, in the main, the same people yeah. from the Obama administration. These are the people who are now even more experienced uh, in this machinery, and they are the decision makers now, or they are the decision, the decision makers once again, perhaps, you know, at the next, you know, rung up on the ladder. And um, let's look at that Afghanistan withdrawal, because when we look at it, what becomes conspicuous is what isn't included in it. On Monday, when the president announced that he was staying with uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, a negotiated withdrawal, the, the decision that I believe was the only valorous act of Donald Trump's presidency to negotiate a withdrawal from Afghanistan, because there was no other choice. Biden says that he reserves the right, as you had heard generals and uh, the Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin say before, to bomb Afghanistan as the United States sees fit, uh, to surveil Afghanistan 
as the United States sees fit, and to continue facing what Biden calls the threats of today, which is to say that we can only justify withdrawing from one war on terror battlefield in order to strengthen our position on all of the others. That's not the abolition of the war on terror. That is the maintenance of the war on terror. That is the war on terror being made more conspicuous, being made more normalized, and being more entrenched. And this is a powder keg that we have seen throughout essentially the entirety of 21st century America, and it will explode once again if it is allowed to recoalesce. The administration uh, is accepting the um, uh, congressional efforts at repealing the 2002 AUMF uh, against Iraq. That's a good thing. That's the result of really valiant, persistent organizing uh, amongst activists in and outside Congress and their legislative allies, and they deserve a lot of credit. Uh, what we're not seeing yet, and because this has been such an effort, uh, is the administration accepting that the 2001 AOMF, the wellspring legally of a global unbounded by time war um, is, is on the chopping block and ought to be repealed. We are not seeing the repeal of the Patriot Act. We are not seeing the abolition of the Department of Homeland Security. We are not seeing the final end of Guantanamo Bay and the structures necessary to prevent in indefinite detention from ever happening again. All of these things remain. All of these things have been normalized. All of the lies about them, the things that you, know, you heard uh, particularly uh, liberals during the Trump administration talk about as if they were you know, sudden innovations. Oh my God. Uh, the government constantly lies about its operations. The, the same people who were so shocked and horrified by that were taking their cues politically from the architects and the stewards of the war on terror and treating them as if they were national heroes. It was the recrudescence of the war on terror. We are not seeing the end of this thing. We are only seeing its normalization, its continuation. We should be very clear eyed about that. And and the the you know, I mean, there's a couple of thoughts I have to this. One is that you know it, it it may not come about during Biden's term, right? But he is sort of uh, I guess tilling the ground, as it were, in places like I don't know Somalia or Yemen, uh, where you know Tom Cotton, President Tom Cotton, or Marjorie Taylor Greene comes in and has the ability to sort of like expand this thing. Once again, it is it's sort of it, 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 it's still feeding it. And what's also amazing to me about what 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 the Trump years were were like in terms of that is that on one hand, you know, John Brennan, a guy who um, had real trouble in 2008 getting into the Obama administration because of his relationship to the torture regime. Not uh, true. He had a real problem becoming head of the CIA. He had right, no problem enough. entering the Obama White House. Right. Fair enough. Um, and. Uh, and ultimately, that is by 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 the Trump years the, more than forgotten. It certainly was forgotten by the second term of the of the Obama years. But at the same time, there was I, very few people I think were even aware that 2019 in Afghanistan was the most deadly year for civilians. Well, prior to 2018, and then prior to that it was 2002. And so there was a sort of like, you know, split in terms of 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 uh, I mean, this is just it, it feeds into that thesis of, of, of the normalization and where we are. Um, and I guess the paradox with with Obama for having normalized that was on the domestic political side, that war of terror that he's feeding in his administration ends up being the. Um, the the I guess the the, the toehold for Donald Trump to rise in the Republican Party, which is birtherism and everything that that on one hand, the terror and the, the war on terror has created the sort of the, the fertile ground for a resurgence of anti-immigrant and 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 anti-black uh, racism. Yes, the war on terror doesn't invent things. The war on terror is a door to all of these nativist violent tendencies throughout American history. Uh, the United States uses these tools quite a lot. Uh, it used waterboarding um, as a tool of native genocide against Native Americans. It used it against uh, Filipino citizens, um, Filipino civilians um, during the Spanish-American War. Um, torture techniques like stress positions come from chattel slavery. Um, 
family separate, you know, child separation, that's native genocide as well. The United States is very well steeped in these tools. Uh, it reaches for them because they are so familiar. We should not see them as deviations. And when the war on terror entrenches itself, that will also be the culture of the war on terror. This righteous, justified violence um, committed by an aggrieved and innocent America that has the right to set the terms for the rest of the world. Uh, the war on terror is the result um, from an ideological perspective, which is also downstream of material interests that propel the war on terror, of uh, the concept of American exceptionalism, which at its heart means that America sets the terms for the world, and those terms do not necessarily bind America. America acts, America is not acted upon. That is the war on terror. That manifests itself throughout the war on terror, not only uh, by conservatives, but by liberals. This is a major theme in my book. We started out in chapter three, which is called liberal complicity in the war on terror and develop it all through to the present day. Uh, as long as this is allowed to persist, this will have the same results. If Biden doesn't break these tools, the next president will reach for them and use them because that's how tools work. So how does this uh, end? I mean, you know, like if 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 seeing the failure uh, in Afghanistan, right? I mean, it was abject failure of of by 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 any by anybody's terms, you know, short of maybe Lockheed Martin's, um, th this was a a failure. Um, you know, we didn't rebuild Afghanistan. We didn't, we, we you know, uh, but even if the, the most sort of vengeful uh, uh, of people uh, would have to say like this didn't, this, you know, the past 18, 19 years of this have been a, an abject failure. Yeah, we didn't rebuild Afghanistan. We rebuilt Crystal City. We built, we rebuilt McLean. Right. We took $6 trillion of public money and redistributed it to the defense industry. And and so, how does this end? Is it is it does it is it bit by bit where people say like, okay, now we go for that AUMF of uh, the two thousand one. Uh, now we go and you know have a, a commission to uh, reinvigorate FISA in some fashion. Is it we uh, break up a Department of Homeland Security? I mean, it, does it w when you contemplate how it might end? Um, uh, and maybe maybe that's a subsidiary question to like does this end um uh wh what does it look like nothing ends unless people organize and force their political leaders to make it end there are many smart people with many programmatic solutions for how this happens um uh at the end of the month i'll be on a panel with many of them these are people um who have fought the war on terror that is to say they didn't wage the war on terror they fought against the war on terror from the start uh, using the techniques of, of uh, the rule of law. Uh, they have and will have uh, many important programmatic solutions. All I can really tell you as a reporter is that unless uh, the political structure and the security structure feels the pressure of the public in an area that, you know, the United States is not a particularly democratic country. Uh, one of the areas in which it is least democratic is foreign policy and national security. Um, unless elected political figures are made to feel the outrage of the public and made to feel like their careers end, unless they embrace the fulsome destruction in an expansive definition of the war on terror, the repeal without replacement, of these authorities, whether it's the 2001 AUMF, whether it's uh, warrantless surveillance, whether it's the Patriot Act, whether it's uh, the Department of Homeland Security, whether it's ICE, whether it's, um, you know, on and on, um, then it, it will continue. But what we see from the dedicated activist work of those who have brought the 2002 AUMF uh, to the point of repeal is that it's possible. We uh, are betraying not only uh, whatever future generations we have left, um, and I'm someone with two children, uh, by subscribing to a fatalism about this, but we will be breaking solidarity with all of the people, not just at home, but around the world, who will be killed by the war on terror. We can't simply say this is permanent, this is forever. It doesn't have to be forever, but we have to make it not be forever. Uh, where do you, what, do we need inciting events? 
I mean, are there um, are there communities, uh, you know, because there it is sort of, you know, genuinely trans ideological on some level, um, or maybe it is trans, you know, an absence of ideology that allows it to sustain. Um, uh, you know, it was it was the the license that Obama had was very dispiriting, um, and you would think that there would be more of a lesson of like, you don't know who could come after Barack Obama, it could be Donald Trump, I mean, for all people. And as outrageous as that was, uh, I mean, where what, what becomes the inciting event for that? Or is it just simply we've got to, um, it, it is it just, it, you grind it out. You just saw people run after a C-17, try and grab a hold of it and fall to their deaths. Could there, what other event? I don't. I don't know how to answer your question. Besides that, yeah, I mean that is, um, yeah, that is that that is what what concerns me. But I do appreciate the the idea. You know, having two kids myself, uh, that um, w we owe it to them and to um, uh, the future victims of 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 the war on terror to fight against it. Uh, Spencer Ackerman, the book is for. Uh, um, Reign of Terror, how the 9-11 era destabilized America and produced Trump. The Substack is Forever Wars, uh, which I encourage everybody to uh, go sign up for. We will put links to both at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Emma. Thanks, Spencer. All right, folks, going to take a, a quick break, and we'll come back, wrap things up. Well, um, can't encourage people enough uh, to check out that book. I think the theme is um, is really fascinating. The way that um, you know the concept of of foreign wars um, impacting us domestically um, is is not necessarily is not terribly new. Um, it was MLK had said, you know, every bomb that, that drops in Vietnam uh, blows up uh, here, I'm paraphrasing. Um, but the, um, the idea that the war on terror basically greased the skids, if you will, for a reemergence of some very old and persistent themes in this country um, on a political level but on a mechanical level, uh, have normalized things that um, are just going to keep sort of this machine going. It's, it's disturbing, and people should check it out. Um, a house cleaning note for folks on uh, Peacock um, and uh, for, for, for the majority report uh, who watch it in other places. Today's his last day. Today is my last day. Bye, Bye, Sam. <laughs> you guys have fun. So long. Bye. Uh, well, you know me. I'll probably be back with my tail between my legs. I have a feeling it'll probably be in about a week. Yeah. Uh, but um, about a week, right? Maybe uh, nine days from now or so, you'll come to your senses and you you won't you won't uh, have. Yeah, you know, I think I could last nine days without uh, without doing that. And then I'll be I'll be Jones and I'll be just doing it. I'll, I'll probably probably by day seven I'll be uh, 
uh, I'll be, uh, you know, talking into my pens and then, you know, just and people do, should know that this you and... are leaving, you know, for whatever period of time on really bad terms. Yes. But so. with that said, uh, for our Peacock viewers, probably see you again. Maybe. And for everybody else, you know, we're just going to have to wait. It's going to create a little drama and suspense. Um, in the meantime, we're going to head into the uh, fun half of the uh, program. I can't wait to uh, watch uh, Lord of the Rings uh, with Saul <laughs> and, and tell him. I feel him. like I just saw it. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to tell him, like. I mean, like, I thought he he didn't really do a spoiler alert there because I thought he was, you know, the, the history repeats itself with Frodo nearly at the end. I'm going to do, I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to wa watch Lord of the Rings of Salt, and then I'm going to read to him uh, Spencer Ackerman's book. Mm. It's a nighttime reading after we wrap up the Harry Potter series. <laughs> where, be, where are you at in the, in the Harry Potter series? Uh, book uh, six, I think. Yeah, you've been saying that for a while now. No. No, we've been we've been racing through book six. Right. Well, we have, someone named Matt may have spoiled something for you. <laughs> yeah, you spoiled a bunch of stuff for me. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll read the Harry Potter series and then uh, move on to uh, Charmers Johnson with blowback, and then <laughs> uh, go into uh, Spencer Ackerman's book, and then we'll get to Charlie Savage's yeah. book. Yeah, you're just accelerating things, huh? Yep. Uh. <laughs> Kevin McCarthy's bruised knees. Looking forward to the majority report without Sam Cedar. Distance will make all of our hot hearts grow fonder. Well, no, you're not allowed to say his name anymore after today. Without so. that guy. Folks, you can become a member of the newly minted majority uh, report uh, without that guy. I'm changing guy. that title, too. <laughs> um by going to majority, uh, join the majority report dot com. That link will still be working uh, for the, the next few hours. The a majority report. Yeah. The a majority report. A majority, a majority report. report. It's actually uh, pretty seamless. It's uh, major uh, join the majority report dot com though. Uh, for that, we'll get. We'll, of course, we'll fix that uh, that uh, that link. Uh, you can become a member today. Wheel. Also, JustCoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY, get 10% off. And uh, we continue to get um, some really nice emails uh, congratulating us on the AM Quickie newsletter version. And uh, you sign up for that by going to majority.fm, scrolling all the way down. Signing up for uh, the AM Quickie newsletter. It's really, I think it just says newsletter down at the bottom of the page, but check it out. Um, every morning, some top stories, a little bit of context, quick read, and uh, you will enjoy it. Matt, what's happening in the Matt Leckian media universe? Yeah, tonight, this very evening at 8 Eastern time at the Left Reckoning YouTube channel, we'll be having Harvey K., the great historian, on to talk about Biden after 200 days. And I'll also be doing a deep dive into Mark Levin, or Mark Levine. Do you know how to pronounce? Levin! Levin. Uh, Get out of here! Yeah, exactly. Uh, I've I, listened to a lot of Levin. Man, that is a tough thing to do, actually. You're a schmuck! I, Get off the phone! He gets very <laughs> excited. And, like, I really, I'm very, uh, we're going to try to deprogram some uncles that may have um, just listened to Mark Levin energy. We want to mm -hmm. try to save people from that, because that's a horrible condition. Uh, and I also read his American Marxism. I read it and pay for uh, his American Marxism, and I'll do a short review tonight. So that's you eight. didn't pay for? No, I didn't. Uh, I found it somewhere off of the back of a bus. Or a truck. Back of a bus? Ba it fell off the back, <laughs> of, a off the back <laughs> of a bus. I forgot the uh, <laughs> I forgot the, the 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 phrase, but it fell off the back of a truck, and so I read that. Um, it's it's bad, it, but I'm trying to get to the bottom of this thing called the Franklin School, and uh, it's really tough to find out. So. See if David Griscom and I can do that at 8 Eastern, Left Reckoning, YouTube. Check that out tonight. Because you guys are on Wednesdays now. We are Watch out Wednesdays for that uh, Franklin School. The, the nefarious Franklin School out of Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> really impressive. Um, folks, see you in the fun half. Left is best. 
Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You nervous? You're a little bit uh, upset? You riled up? Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight, fifty-six, twenty-seven, one half, five, eight, three point nine billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Ooh. Rand Paul. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but damn, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report. I'm what are you just, laughing at? I'm just looking at an I am. Uh, I see the one you're talking about. Is it from the... Can't Trump? believe the amount of innuendos yeah, that yeah. get past you guys. Very unprofessional. And then <laughs> the that's, name is that's innuendo. Rusty Trombone. I didn't know what that was. And I unfortunately... I have no idea what that is up. either. Actually, I don't... I remember being grossed out, but I don't remember what it was. So I think that's the well, perfect... Well, let's stop talking about it, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Because I don't know it, so I don't, I'm fine with it. Have you read my email? Writes, hey, Emma, isn't it cute that old Sam still has the illusion you'll allow him back on after your hostile takeover? Have a great vacation, Sam. Yeah, vacation. He's um, going to be sleeping with the fishes. I'm sorry, it's a death, it's a death threat. I didn't, I didn't mean. A little bit Sam right? Cedar sleeps with the fishes. Where is that from? The Godfather? Wait, oh, was that you saying that? I thought that was a drop that Matt had. <laughs> oh, I thank you. No, yeah, Matt, it's so weird. Matt, because you, you were supposed to save that for That tomorrow. was a voicemail I got. <laughs> <laughs> Did it start with, say the word, and Sam Cedar sleeps with the fishes? Some guys that know in the sanitation. <laughs> Matt, don't even respond to this voicemail. Just wear your L.A. Uh, hat on uh, the show tomorrow, and then Sam Cedar sleeps with the fishes. <laughs> Uh, we don't have a camera on you. We got to get this uh, place in order. Um, carrying on the theme uh, that uh, Spencer Ackerman uh, writes about in Reign of Terror, here is um, former advisor Donald Trump and um, hairspray um, uh, client Stephen Miller 
on the Laura Ingram show on Fox. Is it hair uh, paint? Well, hair paint. Hair, they yeah, spray hair it on. spray is, you know. Oh, yeah. This is it's a, the one I'm not allowed to use. But it is actually a spray uh, that he uses, uh, that paint. Uh, here is uh, Stephen Miller. Pakistan and other neighboring countries. Well, the UAE is helping with these airlifts, I understand, from my source tonight. They're doing big amounts of help to bring people out of Afghanistan. The UAE can take some of these uh, the folks as well. They should, they should be more culturally at home in the Middle East. And I think it makes a lot of Don't sense. Don't repeat Steven. the mistakes of Europe. Yeah, well, and Europe doesn't want them. <laughs> Europe doesn't want every. Everyone's they, like, they, we got to listen to Europe. They've learned. They, they don't want them. That, I'm sorry. France says no. Britain doesn't want them. Germany and Sweden are trying to deport Pause immigrants and they play a temporary halt. We should say that Britain has said they're going to take 20,000 um, uh, refugees. Right. Um, nevertheless, <laughs> the implications of 30,000, 40,000, 50,000, 100,000 in a country of 300 million um, is uh, nobody's going to notice. No, I mean, aside from the benefit that you're going to get in um, – having, uh, you know, a few more uh, uh, Afghan restaurants and, and markets. Like, I mean, honestly, like we could, there is, there, we should take as many uh, Afghan civilians who want to come. Well, the idea that Charlie Kirk is like, yeah, everybody just in Minnesota must not like the Somali refugees that went there. That's, of course, not, <laughs> not the case at all. Like, and it's, it's just pandering to racists, really. Yeah. Totally. All right, but continue to play here as we, um, speaking of uh, racist. Germany and Sweden are trying to deport migrants, and they put a temporary halt on that. But they, they do not want all this influx of migrants into their countries. And I, I mean, I take a poll on Americans, uh, from Americans. What do you think that poll would be, Stephen? It would be 90, 10, no. Well, here's the bottom line to sum it all up. There's a lot of people in Afghanistan, millions and millions and millions, who don't like the Taliban, and rightly so. That doesn't necessarily mean that all those millions of people are Jacksonian Democrats who are pro-American and who will embrace our way of life. The most logical thing to do for people who don't want to live in Afghanistan anymore is to find them a home in another country in Southeast Asia or the broader Middle East. Safe, safe home, uh, and and we do thank the people who helped us, but not Absolutely. hundreds of thousands of people. That ultimately is what I think the left wants. Stephen, thank you. Now, Mayor Bill de Blasio. All right, we thank you, but here's a little pat on the head. Yeah. Thank you, but bye. Bye. See you in a different Southeast Asian country. Like, I understand that they're racist and that's who they're speaking to, but... The, polling about refugees, not that this should be any guidepost, right? Like if you want to poll Americans on how many taxes, if they're going to pay their taxes, it's not going to be that high. It's just something that the government needs to do. The government needs to repair when we've occupied and invaded a country for 20 years with no discernible purpose. Yeah, that's kind of the role of what a government does. When it causes harm, it has to repair it in some way, and it will never be sufficient. Well, and like, yeah, those polls really depend on how those, they're framed and in what context, but they're not 90 to 1 or 90 to, to 10. 10, yeah. And, and frankly, the reality is, short of uh, a segment on um, Laura Ingram's show, it wouldn't implicate Americans whatsoever. They wouldn't notice it. The, 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 like... They want it to, these kinds of folks want it to be noticed or at least artificially inflated because it serves their interests. That's their content for the next like five years. Exactly. It's, it's, it's like, that's how Stephen Miller's going to get his next job. I mean, he's just a part of this racism comp industrial complex almost, and it fits neatly with the military industrial complex. All right. This next clip is interesting for two reasons. I'm not going to. I'm, uh, not, I'm going to do. I'm not going to do a spoiler alert. I'm not going to tell you. But the first reason is, it's interesting because Hannity is in many ways sort of um, disagreeing with folks like Laura Ingram. Like we should. Uh, he is, you know, aware in the course of of, uh, of attempting to, you know, of course uh, to bash Biden uh, and, and neglect the 20 years of history that um, Bush, Obama. Trump also um, are responsible for in uh, Afghanistan. Um, he says that we should allow, you know, people who who helped us in uh, Afghanis. And there was the thousands upon thousands um, 
tens of thousands. Hey, but, are they saying that? But yes, but then the other interesting part comes in and how like you know, he's got to hedge his bets. He's got to hedge his bets. Here's a clip from the Sean Hannity radio program. All right, 800-941-SEAN is our number. You want to be a part of the program. Listen, there is a stampede, not only out of Afghanistan, but a stampede away from high prices, overpriced service from the big carriers like Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile. Uh, the average family making the switch to Pure Talk. Now, they offer the exact same coverage using the exact same cell towers, and the average family is saving nearly $1,000 a year for the exact same service and coverage and cell towers why would you not do this now the people now the word's gotten out well it's simple to do they offer more plans than the big carriers as well unlimited talk text six gigs of data just 30 bucks a month and by the way it's simple to do you just take up your cell phone right now dial pound 250 say the keyword save now you'll save 50 percent off your first month pound All 250 right. on your there you go i just wanted that transition that was pretty impressive but let's play the other one do we have the other one uh, let's play this other one. This one is, is really good. Now, I don't want the entire three minutes. Uh, started about um, a minute or two in. Two minutes. I think it's is it a three-minute clip. Oh, okay. What's that? Just take the last minute of this one. He is talking about how we have a responsibility, and we're going to, you know, and we've got, um, you know, American citizens over there. Now, the American citizens, I think, are going to be fine. Uh, the, the, the Biden administration has made a deal with, uh, the Taliban, it feels like, and they're, they're allowing them through what, what's really going to be problematic are the Afghans who helped us. All right, here it is. P uh, put this up. You are troops. Well, first to get them there, apparently they haven't even arrived. Many of them and rescue every American citizen. And then the Afghans that risk their lives based on America's promise of safety. I agree completely. We had uh, how did how could this ever happen? We got the greatest military fighting force on earth. Pause it for one second. We have the most I, I in need, need to address this. How could this ever happen? Over the course of twenty years, like I mean, you've got to question your premise that we you know, we have the greatest fighting force. Yeah, we uh, that's all well and good, but we evacuated. That was part of the plan. It was part of uh, Trump's plan, part of Biden's plan. That's the best thing I can say about either one of those guys at this point, is that the, they, they took our military out. Of course, uh, how it happens, it happens because for 20 years, we were lied to about uh, our ability or, uh, you know, to, to build up an infrastructure in that country that could withstand even for a week. Um the Taliban and frankly, the desires of people maybe living in the rural areas, which is like, we don't want a war anymore. And so we're just, if we will succumb to an authority, even if we don't love that authority, just to make sure that we don't have a war anymore because we're dying and we're uh, miserated by it. That's how it happens. But that's not why we're playing this clip uh, because uh, Hannity really, He's got work to do, folks. Because the point is he's making, uh, you know, whatever. Of course, his framing is all wrong, but he's not going down that Ingram or he, Tucker well, road of, of of being insanely like, screw the Afghanis, even if they helped us. Right. right? He's got a hedge. Well, he's got a hedge, but then he's also got some other work to do. Competent person as president. I don't think he even knows what day it is. He gives his 10-minute speech. Right back on vacation. How would you like to be in Kabul today as an American and you can't get to the airport? Where are you thinking your life is headed? <sighs> you're one of those family members. I bet you're not sleeping. I, I don't even think my pillow can do it. MyPillow.com, that's where I go. I fall asleep <laughs> faster. I stay asleep longer. <laughs> These are going to be a lot of sleepless nights for so many of our fellow Americans. you got to get them home. <laughs> Quick break. We'll continue. Not even my pillow. Coupon code: Don't get uh, killed by the Taliban. <laughs> Put in uh, "Don't get killed by the Taliban" at mypillow.com. You'll get ten percent off. You can sleep very well at night knowing that you uphold an imperialist. What is regime. wrong with these people that they can't like? In, you know, like 
I mean, look. I love that transition, my God. I, I, th- there have been times where we've had stuff that I just found so disturbing that we had to talk about on any given day that I say no ads whatsoever. And, you know, we do a, a sort of a, sometimes it's awkward, a delineation into our uh, ad breaks. Sometimes it's awkward. But what goes through your mind where you think like, got to talk about this horrible situation in Afghanistan and the suffering that Americans who have family members there must be going through. And I've also got to sell some my pillows. I wonder, could I combine them? Yeah. Why, why wouldn't I do that? If you're worried about somebody stuck in Kabul, wouldn't you feel a little bit more comfortable if you had a clean butthole? <laughs> yeah. Well, hello, Tushy. <laughs> You know, I bet you a lot of those people suffering in Afghanistan don't have toilet paper. We're going to do hello, Toshi. I mean, the idea, like... They're the, all going to the, be crying and but, losing a lot of moisture, so they should use some the, liquid IV. The, the point is that there is no delineation for him and when he's talking about these things and th- its commercial value. Yeah. So there is no awkwardness in doing the pill. I mean, he gets to the break and he... He's looking at his producer and going like, "Smooth transition. Look at this guy. I'm the guy." And it's perf. It's more pro. You just went to school. That's the way yeah. you work in. That's the way you work in my pillow. The parents can't sleep because they're worried about their. Pi- and well, what's the solution? My pillow. Mypillow.com. It's what helps me sleep all the time. It's perfect that it's my pillow too. I, and that is also sort of the icing on the cake. And like, that it's do you a, think a, a he wants to actually do ads for my pillow? Right? Like, I mean, to me, oh, it's, it's just, good friend. It's it, sorry. Oh, oh, he's good friends with that guy. Oh, are you okay? No, All right, I'm not joking. No, I saw Lindell was part of the Trump cavalcade uh, in 2016 at the debates. He was part of the cavalcade. He was there, and Lindell got basically launched his um, his company on WABC advertising with Hannity and uh I'm quite sure they're friends okay I thought it was much more of a this is kind of the Trump wing that I need to appeal to even as I'm saying maybe get the vaccine maybe not uh, they're all they're all they're all and my hedging point sucked yeah they're all way backs but I mean it's just it's fascinating to me that that you make that transition like you can't just or you can't say, like, hey, Mike, you know, we were talking about this this horrible situation in Afghanistan, yeah. and I just didn't think that, you know, it would be even s- serve you to, he's a to, pro. to, he's go, a to pro. bring this up. Because that's of course, what the advertisers want. They want it to be, you know, in, within the flow of the show, make to it be contextual. Fair, to be fair to Hannity, there's never been a time where uh, Mike Lindell has been on any uh, sort of media talking about the complete threat to American democracy and how we're failing. And if you use threat to democracy at mypillow.com, you'll get uh, 15% off of a two set of pillows. This is the part of the right. There's a coupon brand. code every time he shows up. There's a this is a part of the brand. They want it included in the horrific news stories that are existential about you know the the, the Democrats taking control of the voting machines make the pillows into the story envelop them that's what they want listen i know uh the opium trade is really big in um uh in afghanistan but i'm sure if they had some cbd exactly uh from <laughs> uh, just unbelievable I just unbelievable c- cbd relaxes you almost almost as well as heroin there you go uh call them from a that is all satire, folks. Calling from a uh, 702 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, Sam. I'm on. Yes, you are. Uh, hello, I'm on. Oh, <laughs> this is Twigs. I'm from southern New Mexico. Twig from southern New Mexico. What's on your mind? Hey, I'm a libertarian. Okay. And uh, I just called to say that I am the best kind of libertarian. An ex-libertarian? I a, uh, yeah, I'm a reform libertarian, yeah. uh, reformed by you and your show, and and uh, especially Michael Park. So I just wanted to call in and say thank you for that. Oh well, uh, thank you for calling in. Um, what uh, what was it about uh, uh, what Michael had had presented that um, that got you 
reformed, as it were? You know, it was, uh, I would uh, try to put myself in the shoes of the people I would be listening to debate him and you and try to come up with my own counter arguments if I were to call in. And then I realized, oh, everything I'm sa- saying sounds really stupid. Looks good on paper, but, uh, but once you break it down and how it applies to real life, it all falls apart pretty quickly. Um, that is, um, I mean, I, 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 that's a, I, I mean, I, I commend your, your, you know, that is, that, that is a nimble mind that can actually sort of do that regardless of what, in what context, frankly. Yeah. Can you pinpoint any moments or like, uh, like sort of arguments that you really remember like, oh, wait a second. Uh, you know, it's it's really the non-aggression principle sounds like a good thing in theory um, is really what it is. And really what why I was a libertarian in the first place is because I would hear uh, economic conservative and social liberal. So I thought that applied to me. And um, and social liberals like fine. Right. We can still, I guess, be allies with them in that way. But um listening to the non-aggression principle and how that applies once it once it the logical conclusion is you have to privatize the courts and and the roads and everything else which is what has to happen uh it just makes absolutely no sense that is correct (laughs) so i can say um matt if uh there was one specific moment but i think the culmination of of thinking about all those things all the way through um, hey, I did have uh, one thing I wanted to ask, though, uh, that's, uh, that's a separate topic. Please. Um, so the, I think uh, kind of what's pretty obvious that Biden didn't bring up in his speech yesterday is that the Afghan army, I believe, fell so fast because I think it's pretty undeniable that there's a lot of supporters of the Taliban in the Afghan army. Would you, would you agree with that notion? I have not seen much reporting in that regard. I think I think I think it's this. I think that they have not um, they have not been funded for an extended period of time, except for very small, narrow uh, uh, forces. Um, and I think largely because of corruption. I think that's a big part of it. I think that the other big part of it is simply um, they became just overwhelming. Like they. I think what happened in the rural areas, I think there is more, um, I don't think there is as much concern about the Taliban in rural areas as there is in Kabul because it's more urban. It is more sort of, I use this term loosely westernized on some level um, and more culturally progressive. And uh, I think in the rural areas, I think their uh, primary desire was to have no war. And I think that and the, if it takes a central authority to do that, uh, you know, a monopoly of force, if you will, uh, then then that's what we'll go for. We want peace, even peace under a regime that we don't necessarily love. And I think that is a self-reinforcing and self-accumulating uh, force. In other words, the more provinces that make that decision, the more inertia is, is built and it becomes an overwhelming force. And I think that's what happened. I think that's what happened. I think there's probably some support uh, for the Taliban and these forces, but I, I can't imagine it's that much. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, I don't know why y- you would, you would, you would have joined that force. Um, I think it's just a question of like, you know, if you think you're going to get slaughtered, you, you know, you, you, and, and you see your, uh, leadership maybe uh, taking off because, you know, they've got, um, a ton of cash in the bank, uh, and there's been a tremendous amount of corruption. I think you're going to basically say, like, you know, this is the the least best, uh, uh, you know, the the least worst option. Right, and um, and not only you want peace and everything, but you want, I think, uh, the U.S. out of there. I think, uh, well, I undoubtedly, think, a lot of people see us as the invaders, right? Well, without a doubt, I think, um, I think, without a doubt, a lot of resentment. I well, I think the biggest resentment. 
comes from the presence of the United, like you've got two parties, right? That are having, that are at war and you're caught in the middle right. and one party is never going to go away. It's they're, they're, they're never going to go away. They're Afghani or they're Afghans, I should say. And they're not going to go away. And so, you know, uh, you, you're fine to see the U S leave at that point. Because you know that it's not, they're going to leave eventually, that they're not, you know, that, they, that their presence is what constitutes the war. I don't, I don't think that's an irrational decision to make. Yeah. And I think there's also like, nobody likes occupiers. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, but I mean, in any case, I think I have the best solution for the uh, refugee crisis at the moment. Okay. I say uh, move them all to Wyoming and make Dick Cheney pay for their living expenses. I got no problem with that. <laughs> appreciate appreciate the call. All right. Thanks, man. Thank, all right, you. thank you. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of uh, a lot of wealthy people moving to Wyoming who need to be taxed a lot higher. Mm. Without a doubt. Uh, let's go to 847 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hey, it's Josh from Chicago. Josh from Chicago. How are you, Josh? Good. Uh, Sam, I'm really looking forward to your uh, absence because I'm not just very sweet. For the entire time. I appreciate right that. On? I appreciate that. That's very sweet. Oh, wait. I shouldn't have said that. Crap. <laughs> it's okay. I understand. Um, anyways, uh, I just I, I want to sort of say uh, so I've been watching sort of the coverage on Tisky Sour of the um, situation in Afghanistan. I think it's really good, and I would recommend people watching it. Where are you um, watching it? Uh, it's Navarra Media Tisky Sour. It's a, a leftist show uh, that comes out of Britain. Okay. Uh, um, and they've gotten a lot of like uh, people who are from Afghanistan or who have studied the region to like come on to the show. And I think one of the things they've said that's I think very interesting to me in terms of like the way the Taliban would potentially quote unquote govern is that it's very unpredictable what they might do considering, um, well, I mean, potentially like alliances that Afghanistan might have to make, but also just like, it's really an impossible situation to predict what might happen next. Right. Especially in terms of like things like women's rights, we've actually seen like a few indicators that they may be slightly less conservative on women's rights than they were in the nineties. Um, uh, and, and the, the way they used to be. And I just think, um, I think what I've seen is a lot of people sort of rushing to, I mean, I think it's disastrous what's going on there. And I think Barbara Lee's a fucking, I know you played her speech like yesterday or two days ago. Yesterday. Um, yesterday. Yeah. And I mean, she's, we all should have listened to her, but um, I do think like it is like, it's a very um, unpredictable situation. I think what's going on there in terms of like what may happen next. Uh, I listen, um, I think it's unpredictable, but I will also say this and 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 I understand that and it may be the case that the Taliban is not going to be as horrific I'm, as they I'm were. Not, in, I'm not going to defend the Taliban. No, I know I understand. I understand. Yeah. Uh and I also understand that there is a desire to keep hope alive because it um because it 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 makes it easier to accept our withdrawal and i'm not saying that's what you're doing but i know that 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 that, that general yeah. impetus is out there and that's why i mean look you remember a couple of months ago i said people have got to be prepared this is going to be um a crap show and it and it's going to be it may not be for the first couple of months they may need uh resources that there may be a deal that was cut by the united states here's you know x number of of, of tens of millions of dollars um you know that you're going to need to operate there or here's a seat on this uh you know uh un committee or who the, who who knows what the deal is but there's a deal cut and that deal is going to run out and then it's going to be um a, a horror show um and it, it may not be the the same level of horror show that uh the 90s represented um but it's going to be bad and yeah we, we just have to we, we have to be aware of that. And if anything, that awareness also needs to be able to be to translate into getting as many refugees out of that country into this country as possible. 
that they want, that they need. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think it, I think it was Ilhan Omar and a few of the other members of the squad um, are uh, were calling for um, for that as well as like you know evacuating refugees to the United States and also to countries in Europe as well. And I think um, I think that has to be our top priority. Uh, really quickly, because I, I know I've taken up a lot of your time, but I'm sure you saw the announcement out of Ohio today about the Senate. About uh, Morgan. Morgan Harper's running. Har- yeah, yeah, Morgan Harper's running, yes. Uh, and I'm just curious what your thoughts on that are as well, because I really liked her as a candidate, uh, and I think she got screwed over by the COVID outbreak. Um, but um, I don't hate Tim Ryan as like a, a potential senator out of there. But, I, I mean, Harper's definitely someone I'd much rather have. I, I don't know. Do you think she has a shot? Or- I I interviewed a bunch of candidates for that cycle on Ring of Fire. And she was incredibly impressive, you know, to the extent that one can make an assessment during an interview. I thought she was incredibly impressive. I mean, really, really just smart and great politics. I don't have a sense of what happened in that congressional race. I worry... um, well, let's put it this way. I, I mean, I if she can win the uh, Democratic primary, then I feel confident about her ability. You know what I mean? It's one of those things. Mm-hmm. So, like, I would support her over Tim Ryan. I don't know. I don't necessarily buy, although I need to talk to people in Ohio, whether you can really make an assessment. Would Tim Ryan have a better shot at winning in Ohio? Uh, than she would. Um, I think it's an important seat to pick up. I, I, I you know, like I, I think it's an important seat to pick up. I, it, it's it's hard for me to imagine that somebody could give me a definitive enough of an answer that um, that would make me vote for Tim Ryan over her. Uh, but um, but but I, 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 you know, I need to talk to, to people from Ohio to get a sense of that, uh, you know, of like what, you know, it, it, w- would she be a liability in a general election? I mean, I sort of feel like the primary is a good way to test that theory. If she can beat yep. Paul Ryan, I mean, Paul Ryan, if she can read, uh, beat Tim Ryan in, uh, in a primary, um, then, you know, I, I'm confident she could win in Ohio. Yeah. I agree. I agree. I think it's a tough battle. I mean, I, Brian's pretty popular in certain areas, but um, I think she can win. Anyways, I uh, appreciate the call. I really love Ken, Craig Kimbrell on the White Sox. You know, that former I White say Sox I appreciate the call. Goodbye, Josh. You don't say that. I say that. Howdy, uh, MR crew. Emma and Sam, I can't help feel like Tucker's trying to justify right-wing religious um, violence as human nature to his base to justify their own beliefs while also saying paradoxically that our society will fall like Afghanistan due to gender studies and agricultural news. Food stamp increase have had a positive impact on food producers by ensuring a domestic market for high labor resource products like nuts, meats, which have become recession resistant as far as demand side economics are concerned with favorable weather. As we head into late milk stage and early dough stage, corn production should be favorable in the grain belt. Mm. Soybeans are looking good too with only an early, uh, with only an early freeze unlikely possibly left to harm the grain belt. Prices are holding strong and no indication of falling. We could see in Midwest without a motivated farm base uh, could be good for the midterms out here. Of course, Southwest drought and climate change crisis in general remains a long-term threat. But I'm working on a solution. I'll keep you posted. Left is Poggers. Prairie Fire Kowalski. Interesting. Food prices high. Grain prices, or I should say those uh, uh, agriculture commodities high. Maybe you don't see uh, Republican turnout in those uh, heartland states Mm. during the primaries. I mean, during the uh, midterms. We'll see. Um Jimmy Dore's flaccid penis. Oh, okay. Uh, no I more wondered s- if you were going to read that one. I, 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 oh, no, no. I mispronounced that. I'm sorry. Jimmy Dore's sad flaccid penis. Uh, <laughs> no more Sam. Major echo chamber effect. 
Panda. Panda, the fall of the Afghan military is a prime example of built to break capitalism. Noble villain. Question for Matt. Now that this fake war is over, who will we go imperial on next? My bet is Venezuela, unless something changes. I think it's going to be in Africa. Right? Or Asia. Well, we already have a significant military presence in Africa, so not to agree with you, but, I mean, we have, like, a bunch of operations going on there. Without a doubt, but where is going to be the next, like, real, and I, I don't think it's going to happen for some time. Um, I don't think it's going to happen for some time, but, um, you know, President uh, uh, Cotton or Marjorie Taylor Greene or whatnot, that's my guess. Yeah. It, South America's a good bet because of like lithium but i just would think the might do the kids stick with the cia on those ones i don't i don't know if we'll use the military right uh nick g uh understanding there was a peace accord negotiated by trump plus the fact that the joint chiefs don't turn over with the new president to what extent is the biden administration responsible for the specific tactics of the withdrawal i mean look uh i you know i I think if you have the president, you're responsible. <laughs> like, you know, um, you're responsible. You're not managing uh, your people properly, whatever it is, you're responsible. Um, the, the, you know, supposedly the intel said they thought they could get away with it. That's basically it. They thought that there would be, you know, a month or two. That's what I think. And they were wrong. Uh, Anarcho PMC, pinnacle, not precipice. Thank you. I pulled back on precipice right after I said that. Um, tr uh, Tigger, Sam, ways, but... you never heard of the term hump day? How? <laughs> Have you listened to the show? I, I've called this hump day for, 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 for years. Of course I've heard of the term hump day. It was a bit. It was a bit. Kid tested, Politburo approved. This is the same narrative with Biden that they had with Obama. Obama said to be weak, lazy, et cetera, but he was also taking over the government using the Muslim Brotherhood and destroying Christianity. Biden has dementia, but is apparently scheming to transform the U.S. population using yeah. white genocide. The, 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 the fact is, the fact is it's harder to accuse Joe Biden one of the whitest guys in the country, it seems like. Yep. Of. I don't know. Have you spoken genocide. to Corn Pop? He's got a lot of cred with him. He's got a lot of cred with Corn Pop, but that, I mean, just the fact that we know that story proves my point. I mean, the Birchers thought Eisenhower was a communist. Um, it just kind of depends on how much traction you get based on, right. like, if you know, if you're the first black president, for instance. Right. Exactly. I was joking Oliver Wendell, I know. Oliver Wendell Holmes Slice. Sam, maybe we need to pull a page from the Frank Luntz playbook on COVID. Stop calling them anti-vax, anti-mask, and start calling them pro-plague. Tell me you wouldn't get a little joy from seeing CNN Chiron declaring Dr. So-and-so pro-plague advocate under their name. I like it. I like it. Um, Do we still not know that reporter's name? We don't know this reporter's name. No. Unnamed reporter. With a mask that seems to rip off you. What's that? I didn't. I haven't seen this yet. Uh, I didn't. I didn't notice that part of the, it. The mask is a Mondrian, aka a Samdrion. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, the the background here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the we we did hear. You know, credit where credit's due. And, and Nicole Wallace said uh, on on MSNBC the other day that. 95% of the American public would like us to get out of uh, Afghanistan. I don't know if that's the exact number. She said, and she speculated, 95% of the White House press corps would be mad about it. Um, Which is pretty true. And here is some evidence. I want you to just, like, listen. If there was a clip of a reporter going hard at Jen Psaki or going hard at, I don't know who else it would be, in the administration who would come out to talk about this. The, or going hard at Nancy Pelosi or uh, Chuck Schumer about the unemployment cliff that we're gonna hit on Labor Day. Or do what Mehdi Hassan did to, uh, I think it was Cedric Richmond about how 
COBRA and funding that was way more expensive than, say, opening the door for Medicare, which was great. Like, you know. We would play it. We Right. We would find it. Somebody would send it to us and we would play it. I can't prove that that has never happened, that somebody has aggressively gone after this administration for stuff like this. Outside of that example. Like Outside any, of that but example. Like in the White House press corps. In the White House press corps in particular. I can't prove it. But like I say, hard to imagine that that happens and we don't see it. Yep. I say that to prepare you for how hard this unnamed reporter, don't know the name of him. We've been trying for hours to find out. The White House press name. corps. Right. Um, goes at Jake Sullivan, who I am not a big fan of truth be told, um, about the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and to announce by uh, Joe Biden announcing like. And not just the decision, but like these very specific talking points, very specific concerns that well, seem to be clearly picked from some source he has at Langley or the Pentagon or whatever. Well, and the idea that we don't have a, a national security interest in staying in Afghanistan. Here it is. Thank you, sir. President Biden said that there were very few national security interests for the United States in maintaining some peace in Afghanistan. Could, would you actually reiterate that today? Would you say that there is no interest for us having some presence on the borders of Iran, on the borders of Pakistan, on the borders of uh, uh, near China? Would you, or Tajikistan, would you say that, we're, that we should just give that up? I would say that the president does not believe that the United States should be fighting and dying in a war for the purpose of sustaining American military boots near Tajikistan or Pakistan or Iran. No, I would say that that is something uh, that is not, could, we, we, what you just laid out as a national security interest, we would not agree that it is right to ask American soldiers to risk their lives for the purpose of maintaining a presence near Tajikistan. Yes. What? I mean, good for him, uh, you know, for, for Sullivan, for, for, for being that explicit and directly yeah. responding to that. But I mean, give me a break here. That reporter was working himself up over military presence on the border of Tajikistan. Why is this guy covering the White House? Uh, White House? Why isn't he down in theater? You get embedded with those guys. The like, there is a real crop of people covering national security in this country who are so cozy with their sources. And one, I mean, like we saw this during the war on terror of course just how these sources feed them information that is just flimsy as hell and they make it into this massive story about an existential threat and then they publish it and it gets us into another conflict and like you just you saw that play out in real time there the, like the american people are clamoring to know how we're going to maintain our our presence along the border in tajikistan and what that what that how that Im implicates america that's just like nuts and and to your point they'll never get that worked up about health care they'll never get that worked up even about voting rights or or you know immigration or all of these topics that actually affect people it's because this is what their like friends in the national security establishment are feeding to them and then we're like they're the esteemed national security support reporters i mean the this really played out in the in the early aughts was the way that you became sort of taken seriously was to align yourself with the most gravest of of feelings that we must we must make the hard decision to go in and bomb these people um that was the way that you became seriousness that's the way you had gravitas um, you know, we've talked about the Thomas Friedman going on to Charlie Rose after the invasion. Uh, maybe I believe in the spring, uh, the summer of 2003. Summer of 2003. And saying we had to go in there, Charlie, and break this, this bubble. Uh, he was talking about, he was comparing it to another bubble. I can't remember what it was. And he said, we have a, terrorism bubble and uh, there's an asymmetry here 
And we need to go in and pop that bubble. We need to break down doors from uh, Basra to, I can't remember where he said, in, in Iraq. And uh, we need American boys and girls to break down those doors and uh, at the, with the butt of a gun and say, you know, suck on this. Which part of this do you not understand? And that was like the way that he, <laughs> you know, I, you hear people talk about like, you know, we, we shared sacrifice and making the hard choices and it's, it's, it's not really a hard choice. And it, it's just like this sort of LARPing a little bit. No, I, I feel like when you read someone like Tom Friedman, these like major editorial writers that just have zero substance. The reason they persist is because they have the ear of generals and stuff like that. And that's who loves to hear what right. they, the smoke they're blowing. Well, that's true, but it's, they, they're not doing it just for the sake of general. I mean, they're doing it because they, they want to inflate themselves to be able to make these decisions of, am, of life and death, right? I am of life and death for other people. And, and a guy like Friedman in particular was, um, that much more dangerous because to the extent that anybody was going to stop this war, it was going to be sort of like moderate to, you know, uh, slightly left, you know, mainstream Democrats who would say, we're not, we're not on board with this. And Thomas Friedman midwife their support. It's, it, it's, they get to feel like they're a part of some trade secrets and it's like this trade secrets. And also like they're, they're playing God. Yes, that too. Like, I mean, this, this is like, you know, this is a decision that like Kings used to make, right? Yeah. Going to war. And now you get a little bit of like, this is like the, you know, um, have you ever wanted to own a piece of, uh, of, of, of art? Well, now you can buy a share of it. And for a guy like Thomas Friedman, this is like part of being, you know, of the, of the ruling elite. And the way that I do that is I push that, you know, going to war, and I do it with a pen. Yes. And I do it with my uh, perch uh, in the New York Times and with the backing of my billionaire wife. Um, I think his wife is a billionaire. Um, and which also makes it a little bit easier Then you can take a couple of flyers. Well, then you can then you can wax poetically about the asymmetry that needs to be corrected. Which what does that mean? Right. Because w w with the blood of other people, you can with the ink of your pen, write about the gorgeousness of the blood of other people spilling to correct a sym an asymmetry. And you Make can also symmetrical. buy a bunch of really bad metaphors. Yeah. An asymmetrical a, bubble? There's a, a great uh, I have stone quote on a well-connected journalist who says, um, there's a lot of things those journalists know that I don't know, uh, but a lot of it is wrong. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. It's exactly right. And like, if you watch that whole press conference with Jake Sullivan yesterday, it wasn't just this reporter who Bradley and I maybe tried to find out his name for three hours today. Um, like, all of them working themselves into just a tizzy about this. And we never see that for any, for any other policy set in this country. Like, I don't know. It's 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 a specific kind of self-importance that saturates a lot of reporting from in legacy media on uh, on on these kinds of topics that I just think people need to be aware of when they're reading it because you know the sources have their own agendas yep. and a lot of their own intelligence is wrong and what they're leaking has specific purposes. So it's just like there's all of these layers to it that make it a real minefield. Uh, let's uh, tune in to Fox and Friends today. The ongoing Steve Ducey, Brian Kilmeade, should we uh, promote vaccination or non-promotion uh, or promotion of non-vaccination on Fox and Friends? Well, one feels the threat of COVID. The other feels the threat of his career. I mean, you can, I mean, that is what it is. Like, like Kilmeade is like, got to be like, what, mid 40s at this point, right? Mm-hmm. And he's thinking, I got another 20 years at this, at least. But Ducey, on the other hand, is like, I just want to live until retirement, which is relatively soon. So you can start to see how this plays out a little bit different uh, with these guys. Kilmeade's 57. Is he? Yeah. he His good. face does not move. There's right. that. Uh, he may have had a little. That's uh, pretty good for Kilmeade. I mean, so Kilmeade's, you yeah. know, like, he's like, I've got to get this. I got to get this. I got to get something going here. <laughs> 
Um, and so, uh, but here they are. In their um, Cold War. <laughs> they, there's a, there's a little tension here, <laughs> and you really, it's, it's tough to see these two guys. They're brothers in arms. Guess what they're doing uh, in this terribly run city? They are deciding you can't go to plays, you can't go to movies, you can't go to bars, you can't go to restaurants, you can't go to gyms, you can't go to anything unless you have your vaccination card, right. which takes a dollar to make uh, a, a knockoff card, or yet there's a different Celsius passes. Good tip. And the New York City mayor, Bill de Blasio, he's looking out for our interest. I mean, this guy can't get away quick enough, but believe it or not, he's actually running for governor. Listen to him explain to us how he's looking out for us. But the reason I also want to say it's not discrimination, this is about protecting people. In our society, for generations, we've done all sorts of things to protect people. We have driver's licenses. There's so many things we do to protect people. This is a way of protecting people. But for the many, many establishments, they still have a huge number of people they can serve right now who are vaccinated. And we know a lot of people are now going to be encouraged to get vaccinated because of these mandates. It's just the truth. It's going to be the decisive factor for a lot of people. So this is, this is about moving us out of a global crisis. That's what's motivating us. What if you have the antibodies and what if you can't pause it, get pause the vaccination? One second. Pa pause it one second. Pause it one second. I, I actually think a lot of this is about tourism. About uh, force, you know, tour, because, you know, in Manhattan, there are supposedly, I think it's an exaggeration, but supposedly some some zip codes that are like 100 percent vaccinated. Now, I think that's an exaggeration, but I would be surprised if uh, the vaccination rate in New York City was, uh, you know, lower than 70 percent or, or, you know, 80 percent, frankly. It would be the and highest in the country. <laughs> I, I would imagine it's, it's pretty darn close. And to the extent that there's any parts that are not vaccinated, it's going to be in Staten Island which is in many respects an island unto itself uh, in the context of New York. And um, that is for political reasons. And then pockets in uh, Brooklyn that are a function of religious, uh, you know, basically Hasidic uh, Jews, uh, communities who, who, who haven't gotten as vaccinated as much. Um, and then, you know, you have... Um, maybe some areas of Brooklyn, some areas of Queens, some areas of Bronx that are uh, um, unvaccinated because they don't have the time to get off from, from work, et cetera, et cetera. But New York City has done a good job, I think, in making vaccine, vaccines available just about everywhere. And subway stations. And, um, and uh, you know, you still don't have the, the, the luxury of, uh, of taking the, the day off work if you feel sick the next day. But... Um, uh, but we should say, I mean, there are, we don't know the figures right now, but like nationally there are, are co people, you know, who, I, the wealthy white areas of New York City are very vaccinated. Yes. The island of Manhattan is very vaccinated is, is the point. Yes. And, 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 but like I say, I would say, you know, New York State is 70% uh, vaccinated. Yeah. So New York City is going to be at least 70%. Yes. And um, but so with that said, and I think a lot of this City. is focused on tourism because they don't want people coming from out of town and going to these things. Uh, and, you know, we have to adopt the non vaccination policies of other of other states. Um, but go back a little bit here, uh, Bradley, and um, let's uh, check this out. Fifty eight point five fully vaxxed in the city, uh, says uh, Bradley. Now, again. I wonder what happens if you take out Staten Island and you take out some of those pockets. Uh, but go ahead. That's what's motivating us. What if you have the antibodies and what if you can't get the vaccination? You have to shelter in place now like, a, like an American in Afghanistan. And if you don't, these people are the worst, these inspectors. They're going to come blitzing in there, these health inspectors. They're going to fine you $1,000 for your first offense. Think about what everybody's been forced to do in the hospitality industry. $1,000 for your first offense. And it's going to go up to 2500 after that. Well, he could be right. It could actually force people or convince people to go ahead and, and get the vaccine so that they so can go into these places. People making well, their own decisions. You shouldn't get the mayor making your medical decisions. Well, I, you know, if you had talked to him, he'd say, he would say it's a public health crisis. Who wants to and, talk to him? Well, he's the mayor, you'd say. Yeah.
<laughs> He's the mayor. You just said we were going to talk to him. Yeah, I mean, the idea of, like, New York City would make a public health, uh, like, should the mayor not be, the mayor's also not a pest control guy. Should he be making decisions about, like, you know, if we're, we're overrun with rats at different times? Um, the mayor's not a, uh, a a transportation expert either. Should he be making decisions about, you know, speed limits or he's not a fine. In fact, the mayor's not an expert on anything. Should we let uh, should we let any uh, the mayor make any decision? I mean, government this officials is can't have power. Public now. health policy. Public health policy. Like, where was Brian Kilmeade when those uh, Ebola nurses were in uh, New Jersey? My my guess is that he was pretty pretty clear on the authority of uh, of local authorities to uh, quarantine that person. I mean, the, the fines, that seems reasonable to me. A restaurant conducting business all night and not bothering about vaccines is going to cause possibly a lot more than $1,000 worth of damage. Yeah. Yep. Um, 65 and, and older in uh, New York City, not vaccinated yet, is uh, 22%. So uh, 78 and um, 78 percent, and that's almost fully vaccinated. 73.5 uh, percent. That's 65 and older throughout the entire uh, city. Okay, here we go. We got the Bronx, uh, Staten Island, 58 percent, Bronx, 54 percent, Brooklyn, 56 percent, Manhattan, 74 percent, Queens, 69 percent. That's so. It's yeah. I just want to say about those fines for first time offenses for selling uh, uh, drugs uh, or uh, sorry, alcohol to uh, kids under age, $2,500 to $3,000. Uh, $3, so that's a first time offense. So not right. about a, a fraction of what the offense is for selling to underage or people under age. We have to do a better uh, job of getting the Bronx vaccinated and outer Brooklyn. Um, I'm surprised those numbers are that low, to be honest with you. Well, it's interesting, like in, you know, like wealthier parts of the city, you actually can walk down the street and see the vaccine booths yeah, um, and that sort of thing. But I think, I think, I really think the time off from work or being afraid of being laid up for like either yes. labor or childcare is the big uh, concern here. And, and the closer to the city, like proximity. I mean, I guess maybe not so much in the Bronx, but certainly like in terms of Queens, Queens is very, very uh, vaccinated. It's interesting. A lot of people don't want to get the shot and they want it to go away and then move on. That's kind of what it is. Like, um... all right, let's, um, here's Tucker Carlson on Fox um, claiming that 75% of healthcare workers in New York City are not vaccinated. Oopsie. Let's play this clip. In public, thank you very much for coming on. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. We misspoke just a minute ago. Only 75% of healthcare workers in New York have been vaccinated. Again, healthcare workers meaning a full quarter have not been. And the question remains, why is that? And we hope that many more of them, not just Becky Paul, will come on this show and in other outlets and explain themselves calmly, non-politically, because it's a real question and we should have the answer before the rest of us are forced to do something that we don't want to do. Well, there are already calls tonight to move thousands of you, Afghan refugees. Uh, I can tell you that um, it's because of Facebook. The correction. I can tell you it's about Facebook. No, no, not the correction, but the he wants to know why 25% of healthcare workers are not uh, vaccinated. It's because of Facebook. Yeah. And like because of the stuff that you're saying on a daily nightly yes. basis. Also, he just traveled to Hungary. Do we know what the status of international travel vac vaccination statuses are? Like at least in Europe, isn't there a moratorium on people who are unvaccinated coming into the country oh he's my, definitely that's vaccinated. my point is though like he, of course he is yeah 
Speaking of guys who have gotten vaccinated but are not uh, necessarily willing to um, allow other places to provide protection for people who can't get vaccinated, I give you Greg Abbott at a Republican club at the Heritage Ranch meeting in Fairview, Texas on Monday. Here he is at this huge maskless indoor event. And then look at the average age. Let's of- check it out. Here, let's play this. <laughs> yeah, there you go. A uh, big event. And uh, there he is. Everyone's white and old. And Everyone's white and old. Then it turns out a couple of days later, uh, the governor has a breakthrough infection. Three, three vaccinations he got. Um, I don't know when his third one came. He uh, tested positive for COVID, still maintaining that schools cannot impose a mask mandate to protect uh, kids who can't be vaccinated. And um, it, it's going to be interesting to see if uh, we're going to start to see reporting out of Texas. People are at that event. See how much um, if there was a problem there. Um. All right, let's play this one uh, one clip of Trump. Which one should we do? Um, yeah, let's do uh, let's do number one. Donald Trump on with Sean Hannity. Uh, you know, just uh, filling it. You know, uh, uh, catching uh, Sean up on what uh, took place in Afghanistan. Oh. Is I thought it would maybe run through bureaucracy. It doesn't. You need somebody up there that they're going to respect. So when they say, oh, he talked to the Taliban, you remember they were criticizing me. They criticized me when I talked to Kim Jong-un. Well, President Biden told me it's the single biggest problem we have. I said, have you ever called him? Have you ever talked to him? No, I haven't. He did try, but he was not, it was not receptive on the other side. But it was receptive with me, with me. Now, we were supposed to have a war and probably a very big nuclear war. I get along with him great, and I got along with him great. He doesn't like Biden much, I'll tell you that. But I got along with him great, and we had no problems. You remember that. It was, we were virtually, was remember the big button versus the little button and the whole thing? Let me tell you, we get along great. We had a very good relationship. We met. We got no credit for that one. No problem. By the way, South Korea, I got them to pay billions of dollars, billions. We're protecting South Korea. They're very wealthy. They built the ships. They build the televisions. They build, they do everything. They're very rich. They were paying us nothing. I got them to pay billions and billions of dollars because we're protecting them from North Korea. And I had a very good relationship with President Moon and all of the people in South Korea. In fact, they, they liked me and I liked them. But I said, why are we doing this for nothing? This is honestly like you're talking to like, you know, like this is like like talking to, I don't know, some drunk guy in a uh, in a bar. It's just like, wait, no, dude, we were talking about Afghanistan. What are you talking about? Right. You've lost track of like we had a story. No, no, no. This all wraps up together. The the point is, I know what I'm doing. Uh, Why is he claiming that he spoke to Biden about play the second clip? Let's play the second clip. Okay. Um. I mean, he's basically saying Listen, that I, 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 I worked with him. I didn't it, it just they, they came in and they did all this because they didn't like Biden. <laughs> in caravans and other ways, what's happening. So I never saw anything so stupid in my life. Wait, is this number two? Until the last few days with Afghanistan. That blows the stupidity of the southern border away. What happened And what is happening in Afghanistan is unbelievable. And we're being set up by very tough people that are very great negotiators. I'll tell you what, they're great, automatically great negotiators. They've been fighting for a thousand years and everything about them, they negotiate. We're being set up. They have all of those people. And in a certain way, I guarantee you, they consider them to be hostages. And let's see what happens over the coming weeks. But this is not a story that just ended today or yesterday. This is a story that's going to go on for a long time, and it could be a very, very bad ending. We have Americans caught behind enemy lines right now. Hmm. 
his his thoughts are so fragmented and they just like you can see his mind just go to the next thing as he short circuits and like moves on to the next you know he he went from in the first clip talking about afghanistan to then saying well look at this i they criticize me they're not criticizing biden even though biden didn't talk to the taliban but i'm claiming i spoke to him and he told me that he didn't whatever um but he I, did, but the Taliban didn't like him. Right, but I, then I spoke to Kim Jong-un, and they criticized me for that. So then he thought about North Korea, and then immediately couldn't finish that thought, and moves on to South Korea. They gave us billions and billions and billions. Like, where did we get to? I don't know how we move from there to that. It's like getting worse as he just has no way he, he doesn't have that presidential vitamin cocktail anymore that's keeping his brain from melding into mush play the third clip because this is um uh he's not quite aware of 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 who's leading the taliban i think this clip has it well they we'll, weren't we'll, fulfilling we'll their obligations and conditions but the, here's just to finish the people come out first then mm. I was going to take all of the military equipment. We have billions and billions of dollars worth of new Black Hawk helicopters, brand new, that Russia now will be examining, and so will China, and so will everybody else to figure it because it's the greatest in the world. We have brand new army tanks and all sorts of equipment, missiles. We have everything. I was going to take it out because I knew they weren't going to fight. Just one thing, and I have to say, and this is different from everyone else, I said, why are they fighting? Why are these Afghan soldiers fighting against the Taliban? And I was told some very bad information by a lot of different people. The fact is, they're among the highest paid soldiers in the world. They would... Tell us Eric Prince. Yeah, now, he doesn't... Uh, there, there was another clip where he doesn't know who's running the uh, Taliban now. And uh, it's actually the guy he let... Uh, he, he asked the Pakistanis to let out of prison in 2018. Um, billions who had billions. Uh, basically been uh, Mullah o Omar's uh, partner in Kandahar um, 20 years ago. And uh, it was Trump who negotiated his release, <laughs> who basically leaned on the Pakistani. I mean, basically, we, this is the, the main story is Trump bought himself some time in the run up to the election. And uh, in favor of strengthening the Taliban in an extraordinary way, releasing 5,000 prisoners, releasing their, um, uh, their leader. And the deal was this. You don't do anything until I'm gone. Or you don't do anything until my second term. Till May of 2021. And that's basically what happened. He strengthened the Taliban, which is not to say that none of this would have happened, um, you know, without that. I'm sure more or less would, but probably not as in dramatic fashion. And that's basically the story. I'm still glad that we negotiated this exit. We needed to get out of there. But he doesn't, he's not even aware, I think, of what he did. He's just, no. uh, as long as it... Uh, he, he, they all look like Muslim guys. I don't remember the guy's face. The Taliban. Well, he also just like he he his statements are so so st schizophrenic too. He initially put out a statement saying he supported giving Afghans refu refuge in the country. Oh wait, is that not is that not what Levin is saying? Okay. Okay. Uh, the refuge part of refugee was. Uh, Unbeknownst to me. Calling from a 603 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? We don't have much time, folks, so you may not want to hang on the phone. We're not going to get to many more calls. 603. Yeah, this is Ryan from New Hampshire. Ryan from New Hampshire. What's on your mind? Uh, yeah. Uh, I, fortunately, I'm an unreformed libertarian, but I do love the show. You're an unreformed libertarian. Okay. Yeah. Too many libertarians calling today. Um, but I just really wanted to call in and just kind of say that I really think the left should be vocally supporting Biden uh, and him standing up to the military industrial complex and kind of pulling out of Afghanistan where, when it, it looks kind of bad. But I mean, four other or three other presidents haven't been able to do it. 
yep. and he has, and it just seems like, I don't know, it's, it's mainly critiques coming from all sides, and uh, I, I think this action makes him the best president of my lifetime. Um, you know, I think that's, I mean, it's a good point. I don't know that he's getting enough credit uh, for actually doing this, and, you know, um, uh, frankly, and, and the Democrats, like I say, are falling all over themselves uh, to to investigate, you know, this uh, tactical uh, failure. And, you know, as a way of ignoring, I think, you know, maybe their own complicity in the sort of ongoing failure that, that, that made this happen. But yes, I think it's, it's pretty impressive. Certainly, let me put it this way. I think if you had asked Spencer Ackerman six months ago, is Biden really going to do this? He would say, I don't think so. Uh, other people, same. I mean, it remains to be seen, you know, what, uh, what, what the Biden administration is going to sort of like provide for its own license as to what it can do there. But it's also hard to know at this point whether, you know, he's not say, simply saying we're going to we have the reserve the right to bomb uh, as a way of like placating, you know, because there are there, there there's tension within our government between different forces. I'm not convinced, frankly, that on some level the the military uh, brass did say like we're going to make this painful. If we're going to leave, we're going to make it painful. Uh, I wouldn't. Put yeah, it past I mean, and they're already they're already postured. The the secretary of the uh, air force just said in an interview that um, he wants to scare China now. So a former VP of Raytheon. Um, so they're still they're still going to find ways to to spend money. Of course. Um, but yeah. Well, this is one good move in American foreign policy in the last. 30 years, maybe. Appreciate the call. All right. We'll do uh, one more phone call. And then uh, we will wrap it up. Uh, Emma, we've had a lot of people on hold here around the same amount of time. You blaming me for this? No. Give me a number between um, one and five. One and one and ten. One and nine. Six. 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 Okay. Calling from a 610 area code. Who is this? Where are you calling from? <laughs> 610. Going once. Going twice. Hello? Uh, all right. Sorry. Bye bye, 610. Uh, well, Calling from an 804 area code. You are the final caller of the day. Well, wait a Hello, second. Maybe this, not this, the final caller yet. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, what's up? Is, is this is this me? It is you. Oh, my Lord. Okay, hi. My, uh, my name's Sam. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Sam from um, Richmond, Virginia. What's on your mind? Um, I was calling because um, I, I come from a very conservative household, and I am currently dealing with some... Uh, ex extreme disinformation in my own family. Um, my mother and father are both uh, currently dealing with uh, cancer. My dad has been in and out in the hospital perpetually. I'm so sorry. And getting it's, it's okay. I, I mean, as awful as it is, the the situation is something that we've been dealing with for a long time. It's been an on and off thing for like a decade. But um, the real problem and concern I have is that. The misinformation machine is so intense that my mom is refusing to get a vaccine and she runs a business out of her home. Meanwhile, my dad is currently uh, sick with cancer. And I just, I don't know if you guys have any experience converting um, conservatives to at least accept that vaccines are probably something they should get, especially considering how intense the Delta variant is right now. Um, but I was wondering if there is any advice you guys might have in terms of combating that disinformation. I mean, I, 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 I don't know. I, I really, I, I, I don't have any idea. I have idea. people in my life who, you know, who, who are on the conservative side, you know, not close to me, but family. I've tried. It's the same situation. Have, have you guys tried uh, sending some of those videos that people put out themselves? Uh, like, you oh, know, oh, oh, plenty, plenty. I mean, the problem is like, there's such fundamental distrust of science. Like, yeah. you know, my mom the other day sent, shared a Facebook post saying that, you know, 
if uh, uh, a diaper can't contain a fart, how can a mask contain COVID? And like that is just so such fundamental misunderstanding of science. And my wife is a um, is a COVID lab specialist, a medical technician, and she knows all about this stuff. And even I severely doubt that she would be able to um, convince them of the severity of the situation. Like you know, we've we've tried. I tried having a conversation with them yesterday, and they even believe that viruses don't actually want to kill people. Like my mom said, you know, viruses are fundamentally incapable uh, or don't want to kill people because that means they kill their host. And like, I tried to combat that and there's nothing I can do about it. I just, uh, I'm the, trying to find a way the, to combat that. Have you talked well, to her about HIV? Well, <laughs> well, I, they I, listen to Rush Limbaugh, so I'm not sure HIV is necessarily something yeah. they're not. The, you know, the only thing I, I, I could tell you is maybe buy them an air filter or two and say, will you at the very, <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm not joking. I mean, presumably, like, you know, the important thing is not necessarily converting them. It's keeping uh, y your parents safe, right? And Oh, 100%. Okay. And so maybe, maybe you know, the fallback position is, well, we'll at the very least, let me put this air filter or these two air filters in your, in your space because you got this business in here. And what I would do is you can buy on online relatively cheap uh, box fans. You can buy filters too; they're expensive, you know. Uh, but you can buy box fans, and you get a Merv 13 um, uh, HVAC filter, and you, you you tape it on with duct tape, and um, put one on either end of the 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 room essentially, so that it is sucking, you know, uh, it, it's it's filtering the air in some way. I mean, honestly, like, okay. I, I don't know what else to tell. I mean, if you've watched, you know, I wonder, I, I don't know. I don't have any experience with uh, fully on vax resistant people to um, looking at these uh, Facebook posts. You know, somewhat hesitant people, it's it's effective. But fully. Oh, yeah. I mean. But, but, but fully anti-vax, I don't know. Yeah, the whole, the whole situation just uh, fundamentally. Uh, results from the insane propaganda that's going around on the right. I mean, my parents watch Fox News every day and they watch, um, you know, all these other crazy things like right side bro broadcasting and mm. stuff like that. And, you know, they just, there's a fundamental distrust of, of science and it feels like reality a lot of the time. Like, I love my parents. They're wonderful people, but they just, you can throw all the information you want in their face. Like they have this fundamental distrust of anything that they've been told is wrong. Mm -hmm. And that includes preserving their own lives. And I'm at a wall here. And, um, you know, I, I, I apologize for bringing down the program. No, <laughs> so no. I, oh my God. The end, no. I know I'm the last call, but it's something that like, it's been on my mind for a very long time and I, I don't know how to combat it, you know? I really don't know either. I would just like try and go in there and mitigate their risk in any way that you can that doesn't involve them, you know, that, that they'd be more open to, you know, like uh, air filter. You can't, you know, how's that going to hurt? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, I, cause it's not so much that I worry about my parents' risk. It's the people coming in that are presenting even further risk. Like my mom runs a business. She, um, you know, constantly bringing people into their home. And with both my parents sick, that is extremely... Well, that's what I'm saying. Important. You know, the filter thing, at the very least, you know, when they come in, it, it will, at the very least, maybe get the air circulating and, 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 and filter some of that air. Can you maybe just get her to open the yeah. window? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. Anything that I can do to help, I mean, I guess at this point, it's not even trying to convince them of the factual reality it's just trying to you know mitigate, mitigate the, the risk, the risk. yeah risk. yeah all right mm -hmm. well hang in there and, sam i appreciate the phone call uh i wish you the best of luck of course I'm sorry and, you, you know i love the show i've been listening for like two years rest in peace michael brooks and all of that i i love this show very much and it's got me through some hard times as you know dealing with all of this stuff has i can imagine been pretty difficult yeah so hang in I, there i appreciate you guys thanks sam thank you me. have a good day bye bye Perry Fryer Kowalski says, if you have anti-vax family members, deny them your physical company and never let them near the grandkids. I'm, um, I'm doing that a little bit. All right. Uh, 
How much time we got here? Oh, all right. So we are done with our caller portion of the program. That sound uh, signals. Uh, no uh, more time for calls. Let's take a bunch of IMs, and then I am out out of here for um, a little bit. Seven work days. Um, Shatka, I'm a big fan, Sam. I'm a teacher, and I honestly scared when parents protest all around me about mask mandates. After some research into the mandate, though, I see a gap. Schools like mine are mandating cloth masks or any mask. Most other than N95 are effective only for 20 or 30 minutes, and our days are, of course, longer. Shouldn't administration support or subsidize N95 masks, or are we supposed to make the case for multiple masks in a day? I'm actually puzzled. N95, KN95 masks would be better. Um, you know, the 20 or 30 minutes, it's effective if somebody, if um, it may be longer with people who have, um, you know, if everybody's wearing a mask in there, but um, I think the idea is that maybe there's distance and maybe there's other mitigating factors like uh, windows open or something like that. Uh, but, but for the most part, there doesn't seem to be a tremendous amount of transfer in schools if everybody's masked. From the experience that my kids' school had, usually it was like somebody comes in, they get tested, they have it, but there wasn't any incidences of transmission within the school. And, and, and they did stuff to mitigate that risk by, you know, saying like classroom 247, you're out for 10 days. Uh, so, but yeah, the N95 is best. KN95 is second best. And then there are different styles of cloth masks and multiple cloth masks are, are, are more effective. Um, it's really just like, you know, and I don't know why they pretend like it's so hard to understand this concept, but you can drive without a seatbelt. You can drive without a seatbelt and have faulty brakes that you don't get repaired. You can uh, drive without a seatbelt, faulty brakes, and tires that are balding. You can drive without a seatbelt and faulty brakes and tires that are balding and you can do it at 100 miles an hour you can drive without a seat belt etc cetera, etc cetera. you know it, right like there are different ra risks and you can diminish those risks i'm gonna get good tires i'm gonna get my brakes repaired i'm gonna wear a seat belt i'm gonna have a um an airbag i'm gonna drive the speed limit and nobody says like whoa <laughs> People die in car accidents. Why are you wearing a seatbelt? They don't right. work. Right. Or why are, you, uh, why are you doing maintenance on your brakes? People die in accidents. No, it's you diminish. You keep diminishing the risk in each step you take. And at one point, you stop because you're like, we need to drive. Like, obviously, if I don't drive at all, uh, there's no risk of me getting to die in a car accident. Um, and you, you diminish risks. And if you're vaccinated and people are wearing masks and you're under the age of 60, chances are significantly so that if you get COVID, it will not be serious. Now you got to be, you know, obviously there's other risks. If you have kids at home who are unvaccinated, but if they catch it, chances are significant that uh, it won't be serious. But, but there, you know, that's not a hundred percent. It's not even, I think it's probably, you know, closer to 90% that it won't be serious. Um, it's always snowy in Ottawa. It's stunning just how much the press is acting as stenographers for the defense contracting interest. Since effing when was Tajikistan such an important linchpin of the region's stability? <laughs> Literally, the only time previously the country was mentioned was in the 2004 movie Stealth with Jamie Foxx, where a rogue a AI plane blows it up in a warlord's chemical weapons in Tajikistan. 
Uh, Tim Poole's economic researcher, Grand Junction, Colorado, is a population of only 62,000. That's on Colorado's western slope, a high plateau region not too dissimilar from Afghanistan. This is the heart of Congress, uh, Colorado's third CD, i.e. Lauren Boebert's district, which is only R plus six. I think the implications here are clear. Fairchild, not sure they're going to find many refugees named Ilhan. I don't know. Maybe it's like the Katie of Somalia. Sam Flobies, um, Tyler Cohen reporting a Texas school board found a loophole in Abbott's anti-mask law. Yes, and they can require a mask as part of uniforms. Yeah. Imagine that. You can mandate what kids wear, and nobody talks about the authoritarian, uh, you know, steps. But when they wear a mask, except for like me in in uh, right, high well, school exactly, <laughs> exactly. This is totally authoritarian, man. Italian uh, Amy Goodman. Hey, I'm trying <laughs> to be Amy Goodman over here. <laughs> As uh, somebody who went to public school and didn't have to wear uniforms, I've heard an uh, argument for them that they're very, um, they're good for like creating a common experience for every student there as opposed to the uh, sort of anxiety of fashion. And That's, I'm completely sold on I that. was at a public school too. And I think like that is like uh, that, that th there was no uniform. And, and there was, um, I, th I do think that for kids at that age, um, it is, and maybe it's just got to be like white shirt, blue pants. Like, I don't know if you, you, you know, you can force people to buy uniforms. That's too I expensive. wish I had a uniform. But you could, uh, dress code is different from a uniform. Yeah. Dress code means like no ripped jeans. Right. Or no, you know, uh, shirts with uh, no shoulders. And your but skirt it, can't go up. You know, the big thing was skirt length for me. And there's yeah. an argument. Uh, you had a problem with that? You kept running into that? No, I just mean like that was like the thing that girls were most upset about was like, oh, you know. Like I don't know if we line. even had a, a, that in my, my high school. Tank or... tops had to be three fingers. Ridiculous. I yeah, know, weird. Uh, but, but I think there is some value in a uniform, at that least like with, 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 yeah. uh, with like, you know, you know, making that just taking that as an issue off the table for for kids. The the sort of worst memories I have of kids getting made fun of in ways that I now understand is basically class based. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. That's that what dynamic. I'm saying. I wish I had a uniform because I like felt this all the time, like needing to keep up with certain fashion things. I'm on, I'm so bad at fashion, but it was like you know, I, financially, I could my parents could save some money. <laughs> it's also it's also a part of the reason why they do. Um, you know, free lunch for all is to get rid of the stigma. All right, we're going to do five IMs and get out of here. Jay Shivone, who is Robert Ashcroft and what was his uh, period? Robert Ashcroft. You said Robert when you meant John. Oh, sorry. Uh, he did or I did? You did. I did? I uh, Illuminati kids. When Spencer mentioned the, uh, the Ground Zero Mosque, I got an instant flashbacks of a right-wing novelty country song from the time we caught, we got to stop the mosque at Ground Zero. Don't think it reached Bush was right levels. Too niche, I guess. I did a That's Bullshit. That was like the first um, video series I did back in 2010 of that, where I basically just uh, shot me going down to the mosque and showing how, like, this is not, not a big deal. Um, that was that was a period like that was like a little bit before I was really engaged in politics, but that was nuts and messed up. I remember being on a family vacation arguing with people about that. It was nuts. Uh, father of homunculus Robert Gibbs said about the sixteen uh, the sixteen year old son. Maybe he should have picked a better father. Yeah, it was horrible. Josh from Tucson. I can only imagine the next April Fool's episode. M majority rapport. Um. <laughs> The Tim Caucus. Didn't expect a Lord of Rings reference. Excellent guest. Love to see the, uh, the left is best intro. Feels like it's been a while. Sam Schmieder. Honestly, the monstrous Hannity ad read transitions are a difference in degree, not in kind from every other network. Just like Trump on the right wing, there's now just no pressure to avoid letting the mask slip who the business of news is really for, even if there's little substantive difference from how CNN or MSNBC operate. The companies that advertise on those networks are associated with and profit from a brand to just a more polite brand. I guess, I guess, but there is something to like, you know, look, Hannity on the radio has a lot more latitude than in, than in another context. And uh, it's just a question of like how in a, inappropriate you just think that like wait, i need to take this seriously and i don't want to get interfere with with an ad 
Uh, two more. Sam's butt joint. 9-11 happened two weeks before my 19th birthday. My entire adulthood has been scored by war. Uh, scored by war. I look at contemporaries who have been waxing hypothetically about permanent installations in the Middle East, and I feel like I've been living in a different reality. It also makes me think the threat of a draft would augment how cavalierly these people talk about an empire. Indeed. And the final I am of the day. Uh, okay, I read that one already. And this, there's a lot here. Let's pick this one. Judy Rulliani. The M Majority Report without Sam Cedar. Ever get the feeling you've been cheated? Does Sam take the key to the commissary with him when he goes on vacation? Good question. You shan't know the answer. Hmm. Matt, Bradley, Emma, good job today. Folks, you'll see Emma tomorrow. You'll see me in uh, seven working days. Bye-bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know